worship. Come on, give the Lord a big shout. Praise the Lord. Woo! How great thou art, Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, God bless you. Turn around to several people. Give them a hug. Let them know that Jesus loves them this morning. Jesus loves you. This I know. Hey, Evan, this monitor is not doing us any good. It needs to be pushed back further. So no one, it's, it's right up against the stage. How great. Thank you. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, how many know God is a faithful God, isn't he? Woo! Hallelujah. Thank God. We're going to sing about that. Go ahead. Till I see it with my eyes That your word's true, my God You cannot lie And this I'll testify Till I see it with my eyes That your word's true, my God You cannot lie
Come on, give him a shout if you know it. Yeah. Sing it again. So faithful. For the Lord is on my side. Yeah. I will cling to him always because of what the Lord will do for me. And everything he's done for me, he's faithful to watch over me. So I will not be. Thank you, Lord. For the Lord is on my side. I will. 
cling to him always because of what the Lord will do for me and everything he's done for me he's faithful to watch over me so I will not be Come on, give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. We will not fear. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you that we don't have to fear a perfect love. Cast out all fear. Hallelujah. And we sing a hallelujah. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
the middle of the storm. In the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're gonna, You're gonna hear, hear my praises. praises. From the ashes, yes, yes. Your hopes up from the ashes, yes, yes. yes. Hope will arise. Hope is arising in this place right now. Death is defeated. Death is defeated. The king, king is alive. alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. If you believe he's alive, give a shout of praise yeah. to our King. We praise the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Lord, we thank you for your sweetness. We thank you for your love. Thank you for the reality of your spirit, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for your presence in this place, Lord. To touch us, to encourage us, to lift our hearts and our eyes to you, Lord Jesus. What a precious gift we have of the Holy Spirit that you've sent us to live and abide on the inside of us. Hallelujah. Thank you for the songs you give us, Lord, that we can sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to you, Lord. Hallelujah. We can have intimacy with you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for that today, for all that you're doing in our lives, for all that you have touched us with, Father, of your presence today. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen to that. Amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead and go ahead and give them a praise. Woo. How we love you, Lord. How we love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Yeah, praise God. But he is so good. You know, you're anointed right now because you've just been worshiping. You're so touched by the Holy Ghost. Give somebody a hug with that anointing and just minister to them. Hallelujah. Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. We want to help you to know God, experience His unconditional love, to be equipped and empowered to become a world changer. So my story starts out from a life of drugs and alcohol. And it was a really hard path for me to, to follow for years because it was something I was never created to be. And then on top of that, I got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And my life really turned for the worst at that moment. And when that happened, I, I found out about Andrew Womack and his teachings. I studied them for eight years. 
radically and trying to get the healing that he would talk about through the Word of God and how Jesus already had healed us. But that seemed not to work for me, and I was striving and struggling so hard. But then I found out uh, the truth that I could come to my Father, that I could ask Him for help. And, and through that, and through Karis Bible College, that, that truth came to life in my heart. And I found out there was way more to the Christian life than just me trying to make the healing work. And that's when my whole life changed. And from that point, God has been using me and, and helping me personally to help people all over the world through a phone center and praying for people. And I see lots of things that God is doing through my hands that it's not me. This is not something I can do. This is Him doing it. And that's what's so amazing to me is watching the power of the Holy Spirit manifest through my life and cause me to do some things that I can't possibly do myself. Like to see the people that are being healed over the phone, the testimonies that are coming in, just by God using my life and all of my brokenness and pouring out His love into my heart by the power of the Holy Spirit and developing this radical relationship that Adam and Eve and Moses and Abraham had before the Word was even written. What were they doing? They were walking and talking with God. That's what I found. I found my true love. I came back to my first love, and that's what radically transformed me and caused the healing, the healing power of God to come to life inside of my heart. It was God. I found my first love and he has set me free. Come join us today at noon for the Discover Karis meeting. Praise the Lord. I tell you, God is using Karis in a supernatural way. We have Mike and Carrie Pickett here, and they are our vice presidents of our ministry, and they're over all of our Karis is worldwide, and they just got back from uh, South Africa. Is that right? And they attended graduations. We have, what, four or five schools, four, five in South Africa, and one in Zimbabwe, and they did the graduations. And I got to see some of the video and some of the testimonies. And I tell you, the Lord is changing people all over the world exactly the way that we are seeing here. And uh, it's, it's really phenomenal what God is doing. I think we have around 9,000 people that are going through Karis right now at any one time. And, and starting this month, we've got a new intake of students. Don't know exactly how many that will be, but man, God's doing great things. And we have a... Uh, meeting coming up right after this morning's session. After the second session, Lance is up first, I'll be second, and right after that second session, we've got a Karis interest meeting, and I would encourage you to come and just check it out. We've made it so available that there's no reason that you shouldn't come and be a part of it. You don't have to all, you don't have to leave your home. Uh, we even have a hybrid program where you just come together uh, two Saturdays out of a month for eight hours and uh, do uh, teaching together and then the rest of it you do online and things like that. So anyway, we'd encourage you to participate. How many of you would love to come to Karis Bible College if you didn't have any hindrances? Well, we're removing all of those hindrances and so praise God, you ought to come. At least check it out. Praise God. We've got, a, we've got a school right here in Phoenix. And uh, how many of you are associated with our Phoenix Karis Bible College? Let's have you stand up right now. If you are either a graduate or you're a current student here, let's have you stand. Praise the Lord. 
How many of you have graduated from someplace else besides the Phoenix one? How, how many of you are from another Carius uh, deal? Stand up if you're from another Carius location. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Man, isn't that awesome? Man, we're raising up people and it's, I've had people say, well, man, I'm just not sure it's the Lord. I'm teaching on how to hear God's voice and I'm telling you, this is God telling you, you ought to come. You have to have an audible voice from God not to come. Last night we had 11 people that got saved, received salvation and we had 114 people that came forward and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. We had uh, testimonies here. I've got testimonies of people that were healed and came up and received and, and the best is yet to come. Real quickly before Lance comes, let me just mention some of our products we've got out there. I've got a book entitled The Power of Imagination. This is one of the most important things that God has ever shown me and it has revolutionized, transformed my life. Every one of us have an imagination. It's not just for kids. Some people look at imagination as fantasy. But your imagination is how you function. And sad to say, I read this verse last night out of Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 21, where it says their imagination became vain. If you aren't intentionally, strategically using your imagination, then it has become vain. It is non-productive or working against you. You need to learn how to use your imagination in a positive way. That'll really, really help you. So where'd Matt go? I'm going to let Matt give this to somebody who looks like you have no imagination and you need help. <laughs> and this is a book on a sure foundation, which is talking about the importance of the word. I'm going to be teaching on that this morning. And I've got this. I've got a teaching entitled Effortless Change. I've got another one entitled Plain as Dirt. That's a new teaching, but it's really good. That's one of my favorite things. Plain as Dirt. You need to get that. But this is about the importance of the word. Give that to somebody that looks like they don't have a clue. <laughs> they need help. And this one is on the faith of God. Most people talk about having faith in God and it's true that we do put faith in God, but also it is the faith of God that is given to you at salvation. You don't have an inferior faith. You don't have to build your faith. You need to get rid of your unbelief. You've got the, the faith of God. And this is something, this is the very first application that the Lord ever made in my life. Once I understood who I was in the spirit, I began to recognize I had the faith of the son of God and it could accomplish everything in me that it accomplished in Jesus. So this will really help you. That's a DVD set. And I'll let Matt give that to somebody. It looks like you need help. <laughs> Amen. All right, so we've got Lance Wall now with us. Man, Lance and Annabelle are here. And uh, I met Lance, I think it was eight years ago, he came and spoke at one of our conferences. And I tell you, I just was really impressed. Uh, I'd never heard anybody ministered quite the way that Lance did, never heard anybody since then. <laughs> And I'm sure he's got a more impressive resume than what I'm giving him. But the thing that stands out to me is he loves God and he's committed to God and God is using him. He sees things from a different perspective than what most of us do. And it really is beneficial. So I want you to open up your heart and get ready to welcome Lance Wall now as he comes and ministers to us. Thank you, Thank you brother. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, look, a whiteboard. How convenient. Uh, do we have a microphone? Let me just introduce Annabelle real quick. She is the uh, secret sauce, the spark behind the spark plug. Come on up here, honey. So, there's, so like, here's like uh, the reality is I teach it, but she actually lives it. <laughs> And uh, that could be really convicting, but uh, well, honey, just go ahead and share. She loves being here. Now she, and so she put her hand up saying she wants to go to Karis. So I just want you to know, I'm not gonna teach everything you need to know. <laughs> well, why wouldn't I wanna go? Of course, that's what I'm saying. I, I mean, just, just the fact that you're- I need a little more time, 
However, I do play these. I, I listen to uh, Andrew. I love the word. And all you guys, you got to get um, their voices in our, in our heads, right? We got to listen so we get our God faith activated. Because he's got big things for us to do that we know not of. <laughs> and that's a fact. So let me just give you guys a real quick background. So a couple years ago, Annabelle says to me that she's got this burden for single mothers. They're living in cars and they have... They have children, but they don't have a place to live. And, and she heard about these kids that don't have beds to sleep in. And she's going on. Now, I, honestly, well, I'm saying this real briefly for a reason. Many of you at Karis and that are coming alive in vision will find that no sooner has God activated in you, grounding in your identity and your purpose, that you'll start to get the call to do something. And it's in the call to do, just like that beautiful video we saw earlier about the brother that had MS, and then next thing you know, you see him up praying for people. You could see the transition from desperately looking for help to getting the answer, and then immediately, what does God do? Puts him in the pipeline to give it to other people. So we've been in ministry, like, you know, we pastored churches and all this. So this was, we have no background in what she gets into. And she tells me she wants to start to help these kids and these single mothers. Well. The reality is we got like four or five warehouses now. We've got a throughput with like a thousand beds that have come through, uh, you know, our house, basically. And I got it out of my house and put it into warehouses because it was in my living room for a while. But the part that I want you to catch is she doesn't have a degree in this. She wasn't trained in this. She didn't have advanced training. The government didn't sponsor her. The entire thing is an operation of faith. And, it's, and, and, I, I, and I did not do it. I sat over here and said, I'm busy. I can't do this. And so this whole thing took off on its own. Now, that was the runway I wanted to give you. So based on that, what would you say to them about answering the call that's on your life? In our case, we just had a little flood in the house that we had to evacuate a bedroom. So we needed to give away a bedroom set. And that's how the whole thing started because the family we gave that bedroom set said, can you get... The mom said, could you get my, my little boy a bed? He never slept on a bed in his life. And I said, well, what does that mean? She said he slept on the air mattress, he slept on the couch, he slept in the car, he slept on the floor, but he never slept on a bed. I said, oh. she's like 25 minutes from my house. This is like almost our same zip code. And I thought, oh, my friend Wanda was with me. She's like, not on my watch. So Wanda bought the first twin. And then that's how it all started. But my point is, and they had a friend who needed a bed, a cousin who needed a bed, an uncle who needed a bed, an aunt who needed a bed. And, and we all of a sudden were in the bed business. <laughs> One time Lance went to a mattress firm to buy a, a oh, I, pillow. I left a pillow at a hotel. You know those pillows you get? that I got one of those pillows I really like, the squishy pillow and stuff. So even though Mike Lindell's a friend of mine, it isn't his pillow. It's a different pillow. So... I left this pillow at a hotel. It's like a $7,500 pillow. And I'm, you know, I'm part Jewish, so I was having a lot of remorse over this. So I'm calling. I want to get them to ship. I'm estimating what's the cost of a FedEx versus replacing the pillow. But they, they couldn't find the pillow. So I go to mattress firm. And I, so I go to the guy. I go, hey, uh, you got pillows here? It's in South Lake, Texas. He goes, well, yeah, I can order you a pillow. I got your pillow. I said, okay. He goes, what's your name? Well, on the wall now. He goes, to the and, he's, and he looks at the screen, he looks at me, almost like it was an FBI thing where my name came up. He sits back and his eyes open up and stares at me. I go, what, what? He goes, uh, wall now? Who is Annabelle? I go, hey, she wanted in the multiple states? She's my wife. He goes, well, according to this, she's, uh, she has come in here and bought like around 300 beds. <laughs> It's like, so they had a whole rap sheet on her like that. That's when I came home and said, tell me about your ministry again. <laughs> anyway, I, 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 anyway well, you guys do whatever in your hand. That's how it started. Now the first kid, now here's the other thing. When God's in something, what I want you to catch is, the reason why this is an instructive moment. Okay. The water disaster. Yeah. So we have a water leak. Now, now normally, if your kid leaves on a faucet and it destroys the carpet of a whole room and it I mean, you know, you look at that and you go, this is not a good thing. And, and, but I couldn't get angry. I was upset, but I couldn't kind of, it's like, you got to be more responsible with faucets in your life, kid. Yeah, this is good. Being underneath the wall, it wasn't a faucet. Well, it was a leak okay. that he's responsible for somehow. It's his bathroom. Blame over here. I mean, it's the story of our life right here with the kids. I'm telling you, the kid's responsible for what the, the leak in the bathroom. It's his bathroom. So anyway... 
but I couldn't get upset. And it was like down here in my spirit. It's like the Lord said, don't worry about it. Don't just chill out. It's like the whole room's all the furniture's coming out. They got to go in, pull up the carpet, replace the carpet. Here's the point. Annabelle always repeats the story the same way. We had a water disaster in the house. The reality is, had that not happened, she would not have gotten into what she's doing. So you never know the redemptive purpose of what God works out of a problem, is my point. So we all want to live above a problem, without a problem, not having a problem. The devil's in the problem. Well, how do you know God isn't manipulating a problem to position you for your purpose? Hey, that's a quotable quote if you don't know that. So we're Furnishing Families of Texas. We just got Furnishing Families International. And we're growing. We're growing quickly. So hallelujah. International. Just finding out. It's going... I'm barely keeping up with Fort Worth and we're already international. All right. I mean, I got stuff coming to the door to this day. I go, why is stuff coming to the house? She goes, well, I can't leave it at the warehouse, you know, because uh, it's outside the front door. So we got, we are, we are like Walmart at our living room. All right. So Andrew was sharing last night something, which is, uh, I think is very, uh, I know, he said that he hadn't done that before, really, a conference with that message. But boy, is that on point. Because we're right now at a period of time where we have to be able to hear the voice of God. You all in agreement with me on this? And there's a cacophony of voices. And how many of you know there's tremendous anxiety about what's happening in the United States because it looks like it's lost its mind. It's like a, like a, like a clown car took over Washington. We don't know what the heck's gone on. And it's like, what? What? You got this guy that gets arrested, you know, you got a guy dressed as a woman, shaves his head, wears lipstick, runs around with dresses, and he's in charge of like nuclear waste programs or something. <laughs> Goes to the airport, steals luggage. This is not a normal fetish. Steals people's luggage twice. That's, that's, that's the people that are getting promoted in Washington. And, and here's the weird part. We are 30%, 40% of the United States is actually evangelical, Christian, charismatic, panic. We're a large number of people and we have no real consolidated representation up there on the hill, except for a couple of firebrand mouthy politicians on the Republican Party for the most part. We don't have, why don't we have greater leverage in this country? It's, it's, it ought to be a sobering question. It's not like we outnumber the LGBTQ movement by 10 times, but we have 90% we have less impact. What the heck is going on? Anybody ever ask that question? Well, when you get the answer, tell me, I'd like to know. So I'm, uh, I'm looking at the, these things and, and you would think that, I, so I started a, an industry, you may not know this because I'm fairly unknown and I, I don't mind being unknown, it's really inconvenient to be unknown um, because then you can go travel without having to have security everywhere you go. I only need security when I do my own events. But the, um, which actually sounds like a funny thing when you think about it. But the, but the, the reality is, People don't realize that when Donald Trump came on the scene, for instance, going back to Donald Trump days, 2015, I get a call to go up to, to um, Trump Towers to go meet with him because Paula White is gathering together evangelicals to meet with Trump. And I was off the radar as an evangelical, really, I mean, to an extent, because I work with corporations and businesses and professions, and I'm, I'm the guru of the seven mountains. I'm the guy that came up with the concept of seven mountains of culture and created a veritable cottage industry of seven mountains people. But uh, I was happy to, you know, kind of stay off the radar because the newspapers started hammering on seven mountains and they were trying to figure out who to attack because the devil hates the concept. He hates the concept of you as a mass of people mobilized to take any influence on planet Earth. It's kind of like Israel. Israel is a little dot in the world. You ever wonder about this? Little dot it's the size of New Jersey and all of history seems to keep revolving around the crisis in the Middle East over Israel. Got all that land over there in Syria and Egypt and Jordan. Why don't Palestinians are always fighting with Israel. Why doesn't one of those other countries give these guys some real estate? It's weird. They all want to get into this little territory called Israel. And it's like Jews don't have a history of being persecuted. Give them a little place to hang out. Anyway, why is Israel such a big deal? Why is that little piece of topography and geography such a central kind of flashpoint of all these global events? Because it's the one little place in the real estate of the world where God said, that's the place I'm going to mark off. And the devil hates the fact that God's invasion starts in that little, re little region. The moment you take territory, the devil freaks out. 
He doesn't mind you talking about eternity and heaven and he doesn't want you to go there. But I mean, as long as you postpone doing anything till you get there, he's happy with you. But the moment you got real estate down here, like a little Jew, like, like, you know, okay, we're going to put Boca Raton. If if Jews were going to take over Boca Raton, that would be the next crisis point in the United States. (laughs) Because the devil doesn't want you having any real estate. Does this make sense to you? Here's the problem. Jesus said, occupy till I come. He didn't say be preoccupied with when I come. We've made an industry out of projecting and analyzing when we go and he's trying to get here. I don't know what we're going to do when we go. He's coming back. So here's my thought. I read something once. The guy says uh, you can. uh, Oh, Trump Towers. Yeah. So I'm going to Trump Towers. And uh, I think I have an angel here reminding me what I talk about as I get older. He says, hey, 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 back to that. Okay. so I go to Trump Towers. And I, how did I get there? I got there because Paula White's producer heard me at a meeting with 200 people. I, w- I go to a meeting with 200 people because a guy, uh, Rick Joyner, calls me up and says, you need to go to this meeting because uh, I want you to meet this, uh, the billionaire family wants to talk to you and you know, you do the Seven Mountains thing and they want, they're going to come to this meeting. And so I go, okay, I'll go to this meeting. And so, you know, my friends tell me, go somewhere, I'll go because I figure, you know, I might not hear God accurately. So 200 people in a garage, literally on metal chairs. And then rickety, you know, whiteboard is up on a platform. I got up, I do my little Seven Mountains thing. I never, the billionaire never showed up. I thought, what a waste of time. I'm flying home. I'm going, God, what am I doing with my life? Other people are on building this and they're building that. And they got mega churches and TV programs. And what am I, I'm running around looking for a, a, you know, a billionaire. I'm like the lost tribes of Israel. I can't find anybody. I'm in a garage. And I'm kvetching the whole time. I get home and, uh, well, a couple months later, I get a call. And my secretary almost, she says, you're going to fire me. I go, why am I going to fire you? Two weeks ago, you were invited to go to Trump Towers to meet with Donald Trump, and I didn't get the voice message. I just found it today. I go, yeah, you're right. I should fire you for that. (laughs) When's the meeting? She goes, tomorrow. Tomorrow? (laughs) Call him up and tell him I'll go. So I had to go up. I got to go flying up there. Now, I get up there to this meeting and I'm seeing and this is a little embarrassing because there's Kenneth Copeland there, there's Jensen Franklin there, there's Paula White there, there's the, the, the TBN is there. And I'm looking at them and saying, these are all like big, everybody knows who they are. And I go up to the guy standing in front of the elevator and I say, excuse me, excuse me. I just want to make sure I'm supposed to be on this list here. I'm kind of what you call a ninja out there. I kind of move in the shadows of culture. And uh, he says, yeah, you're on the list. I go, well, how do you know I'm on the list? He goes, I put you on the list. I heard you in this meeting in a garage down in Florida. And God told me you're supposed to meet Donald Trump. So you see, none of you are safe because you could be unknown, <laughs> wandering around like the lost tribes of Israel, but God will put you exactly where you got to go if you're obedient. So I get there. And I, all these guys, you know, and they're talking, talking. And then, so the interesting thing is, oh, man. Bottom line is this. There's like two meetings going. I go up there twice because I get called up there twice. And I'm saying, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? I do seven mountains at this point. Then the Lord says, well, you're going to tell people that Donald Trump is my anointed candidate and nobody's going to like it. See, right now, we gotten past that moment. There was very few people coming out on this subject in early on, I'm going to tell you right now. We weren't coming out of the closet. Why? Because we had all these nice evangelicals running. Who needs a heathen from New York when you got Mike Huckabee, you got Ted Cruz, you got uh, Marco Rubio, you got uh, Ben Carson, everybody, all the nice evangelicals very happy. Oh, Mike Pence, what a nice guy. And then you got this blusterous, three times married New York billionaire guy with a media. Right? Everybody, every Christian in the world knew this couldn't be God's choice. It's the one God chose. What does that tell you about God? He's not as religious as you think. So anyway, so God says, okay, let's go. Let's be honest about this. Paula White is, is her second or third marriage. Donald Trump, between the two of them, they got like six marriages. Perfect combination. America is so screwed up. I'm just going to do this because my church is so messed up. They've done such a lousy job. I think I'm just going to put a finger in their eye and provoke them to jealousy. That's my theory. So 
Along comes uh, Trump. So I'm in the meeting and, you know, there's all kind of discussing the race issues and everybody's trying to make him a, a hate guy and he's not a hate guy and he's trying to analyze what's going on. Why is there riots in his meetings? And then we're talking economics. And I'm sitting there going, what am I doing in this place? I'm not a race specialist. I'm not an economist. I'm not a politician. I don't want to get involved with politics. I don't even, I've never been on The Apprentice. So what am I doing here? <laughs> the Lord says to me, Every time you pray in tongues, you tell me this is what you want to do. I'll tell, let me tell you something. That's why when Andrew's going to talk about praying in the spirit, listen, man, you got to get this down. I was praying stuff in my head. I had no idea the trouble I was getting myself into. I'm praying myself into this political thing. Every time you pray in tongues, you tell me this is what you want. Why are you complaining to me? You asked me to do it. <laughs> so I'm telling you, our trajectory has been so outside of the culture, so outside of the earth, so outside that when we start going in, I tell you, the devil's going to freak out. Every time I step over, all I got to do is step outside. I'm going to show you. I step outside the religion mountain. I step outside of the church and religion sphere. And I go over here. And if I step outside that comfort zone into dealing with a business, a corporation, or government, boom, the Daily Beast, uh, Yahoo, uh, the New York Post, uh, Washington Post, I get all kinds of crazy, ridiculous, distorted media coverage. Rolling Stone magazine comes out with a big hit article on me because I went to a Doug Mastriano rally and talked for like five minutes. That was all I had to do. The devil freaks out when you show up because he, because you're the only thing that can stop him. Let me say this again. You are the only thing that can stop the devil taking down America. So expect it. They got all these articles, all my nuts of fagin Christian friends that are all writing these warning sheets and having people sign lists to denounce Christian nationalism. We don't even have a Christian nationalist movement, but they're ready to denounce it in case it shows up. <laughs> I got friends of mine signing off on this, respected friends. I tell you, what the heck are you doing? Well, they're intimidated not to. Why? Because I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, So breaking controlling spirits, by the way, is one of my products on the table. <laughs> Since we're on the subject of religious spirits, you got to break and you break them by praying strong in the spirit. But what Andrew said last night, I don't want to lose his thought. The conscience, man, here's the problem. Everybody wants to hear God, but here's a, this verse is fascinating. I'd, lo I'd love to hear uh, Andrew, you expostulate on this verse. Today, if you will hear his voice. It's, everybody wants to hear the voice of God. But then the, in Hebrews, it says, today, if you're willing, hear his voice. Well, we're here to hear God's voice. Yeah, but maybe not on the subject he wants to talk to you about, which is the area he's convicting you of. Today, if you, I want to know who's going to be, is DeSantis going to run? Is Trump going to be president? Here's what the Lord said to me. He specifically told me, he said, now, you, I inaugurated the whole Trump prophetic phenomenon. Now, nobody's going to tell you that because we got all these YouTube sensational prophets prophesying about elections we're not winning. Put that aside for the moment. We got prophecies everywhere about what's coming in America. Here's the problem. We're developing the itchy ear complex in the body of Christ at a time when we should be learning to respond to the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit and maturing. We're all preoccupied with who's going to be the next president. This will blow your mind. I'm, I was the guy, that, and when I was doing it, this is how Andrew and I actually connected. I put out a video and I said, hey, Donald Trump, this, this, the Lord told me the 45th president of the United States is going to be an Isaiah 45 president. In the Bible, it's called Cyrus. Cyrus was not a Christian. He was not a Jew. He was an outsider who God anointed to go into a Babylonian system for the sake of his people. Trump's the guy. It's not the other people. This is, and Andrew I took it and he sent it out to his ministry people. He, he heard it, it resonated with him. And I, and I started noticing Andrew because he was one of the few leaders that caught it and took a stand. Now, after Trump became president, everybody and his brother comes out of the closet. Oh, I prophesied that. I said that. I said that. 
And so, it create, like I said, it's another cottage industry of prophets. But here's the problem. All the prophets are prophesying about what's going to happen, the next wave, the midterm wave, the, uh, this wave, the next president. And then every time it doesn't happen, there's always the same prophetic reframe, which is God's about to do this. He's actually, it's all a plan. He's exposing something. He's exposing, he's exposing. Well, let me tell you something. My, my theory of this now is that the Lord spoke regarding Trump and to a great extent, I will never fault my prophetic friends for getting involved with this because for the most part, Christians were, weren't really, really engaged in the political arena. And the prophets ought to be on all seven mountains. We should be talking about the, what God wants to do. So I'm very forgiving on the subject. But here's the missing piece. And I couldn't figure it out because the Lord said to me, I'm not going to be talking to you much about what's coming nationally for America because my people have developed itching ears. They're not hearing what I'm saying. They're hearing what they want to hear and heaping to themselves teachers that will titulate their curiosity about the conspiracies that infatuate them. Wow. So I said, well, I, like, I always like to have two or three verses for everything. I'm a big Bible guy. Whenever I have a wild idea, I test it with two or three verses. And the Holy Spirit's always good. Last night when Andrew was teaching about how, how every sinner knows God's real, they just suppress the knowledge of God and start to agree with a lie because it's convenient. I thought, Lord, I love those verses right there that Andrew's giving. Can you give me another verse that Andrew didn't quote? And while I'm sitting there in the front row, you guys want to get it? I think it's kind of amazing. So, uh, and I get this other verse, and it's from the Gospel of St. John, and it's chapter 1, where John 1, uh, uh, verse 9. We'll go ahead and take a look at it. Go to John, chapter 1, verse 9. In the King James, God always talks to me in King James, I don't know why, because I grew up in King James. That was the true light which gives light to every man which comes into the world. Jesus, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. What does that mean? That means that every man that's coming into the world has had an encounter at some time with the true light. What that atheist said about seeing God in the sky and the stars, and he looked at the wiring of the city. Jesus is the light of the world, and he has enlightened every man coming into the earth. There'll be no one that will point to him and say they never had a divine moment when God revealed he's real. He is the light that lighteneth every man. You see that? Every man coming to the world, he gives light. Not some, not a few, not if they hear the gospel only, but everyone will be accountable because God has made himself known. That was the verse you quoted last night in Romans. So Jesus is the light that lighteneth every man. He has, he has made himself known to every man. Now, the conscience is the issue. I want to go to Jeremiah 23. The reason why the Lord said to me something interesting about what's coming up with America. And, and actually, I'm very hopeful because I'm hearing the Lord speak about this. But he's not talking about election cycles. Matter of fact, I was, it was while I was, I was praying. And I remember when Jesus turns to Peter, when Peter is being reinstated into his office, and uh, it's after the ascension, and Jesus tells Peter, feed my sheep. Verily, when you were young, you went and ran wherever you wanted to go, but when you're old, you're going to stretch forth your hands and another's going to take you where you would rather not go. And in saying so, Jesus signified by what death Peter would glorify God. When you're old, someone's going to bind your hands and take you where you don't want to go. When you were young, you went where you want, but when you're old, you'll glorify me by going where you don't want to go. There's a word. You're not always going to go where you want to go. Sometimes God's going to lead you where you don't want to go, and that's how you're going to glorify him. So what I love about Jesus is he could tell you how you're going to die a death you don't want to die, and it's edifying. <laughs> you don't see Peter going, oh, boy, that's, whew, that's heavy. I better think about that. He goes, oh, really? How about him? He wants to know how John's going to die. Isn't that crazy? Wow. So he's got his best friend over here, John. Typical. So this is so, this is so human. It's like, wow, what about him? 
He literally goes, what about him? And Jesus rebukes him. He says, oh, really? Well, if I will that he is alive till I come, what business is that of yours? You follow me. So the Lord says to me while I'm praying about the next election cycle, what's going to happen? And maybe it was me saying, Lord, you know, every prophet's prophesying, uh, you know, uh, what, give me a word on what's going to happen uh, like you did before with Trump. The Lord says, what business is it of yours what I do with Trump? <laughs> well, here's, here's, I'm telling you the word of the Lord of the prophets. What business is it of yours what God does with Donald Trump or DeSantis? Your job is to follow Jesus. He's not going to hold you accountable at the judgment seat for whether or not the election went right or wrong. Unless he called you to run. You're accountable for what you have influence over. You don't have authority over the White House. You say your prayers, you put your vote in the spirit realm and go do your thing. You'll do more damage to hell obeying God and the assignment God gave you than getting involved with an assignment God didn't give you. So I said, well, what, 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 what are we missing here, Lord? And the Lord said, I, I want my people to start to get to hear my voice, convict them. So their conscience come in alignment. Not because there's always big sin. It's just that if you suppress the voice of God in any area, you're in danger of suppressing God in bigger areas. And the great deception that comes upon the earth that causes many to fall away is only great because the little deceptions were tolerated. Jeremiah 23. So I said, well, Lord, what, what are you saying? The Lord says, verse 21. I'm not saying it's about everybody, so don't get me in trouble with everybody. But verse 23, verse 21, chapter 23, Jeremiah. I have not sent these prophets, but they ran. I haven't spoken to them, but they prophesied. But if, if they had actually stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places and I don't see? What is the Lord saying here? He's basically saying that if we, as prophetic people, stand in the counsel of God, there'll be two things that'll be happening. We'll be accurately forecasting and proclaiming those things that are coming, but they will not produce the spectator, smug, detached mentality of a popcorn eating, self righteous conservative waiting for God to expose the devil. It will have a second part to it that'll convict you of your own need to deal more ruthlessly with the flesh and the devil in your own life and repent of those things that you're not doing that you know you ought to do so you can align more accurately with the awakening that God is sending. Your, the reason why Karis is important for you, for all of you, here's why. Because what I'm saying now is the kind of truth that can set you free. What you'll hear taught in Karis and I've been around, I'm all over the body of Christ. It's like my friend Mario Marillo says, I've been around for like 40 years. I've seen every float in the Pentecostal parade. <laughs> so I got a little discerning on what goes on. By and large, Andrew Womack got the healthiest fruit in the body of Christ that I've inspected. <laughs> Across the board. It's healthy. It's not troubled by some of those perplexing eccentricities that often go with other flows. It'll, it'll keep you clean because it's, it's the word of the Lord teaching you the fundamentals of how to walk with God, please God, and hear God. And as, as a unit, as a company, I'm a little jealous because I do think that it's a group of people that are positioned uniquely to hear marching orders of what the Father wants to do and advance in all of the Bible schools globally and nationally to move vigorously in that direction when the Lord says move. If these prophets were hearing from God, they would produce conscience and conviction in the church. 
Let that be the test when you're listening to your favorite internet prophecies. Whether it's encouragement so that it just bolsters your confidence that you're right and they're wrong, or whether it produces a finger of God in your own heart saying, these things need to be made right in your life. I say that because a friend of mine, uh, Ken Eldred, said something to me recently. He said, I'm convinced that the great revival that's coming for many of us is going to be just in the adjustment and repentance we make in the little areas that God shows us. In other words, as a fallen nature, we, uh, we struggle with a great many infirmities that we don't always see. And, uh, and the Bible does say that the, the sin that does easily entangle, it's not hard, not hard in these days when the devil's manifest in your face to have a wrong reaction, wrong response, whatever. But I remember something that Charles Finney said, which is very important. He said he had remarkable power as an evangelist. And he would notice that just a few words coming from his mouth would fix themselves like arrows in the hearts of other people, producing piercing of their conscience. His power as an evangelist was he walked in such a way that he could get into the conscience of people quickly. And once he pierced the conscience, they were seized with a conviction that they had to get right with God. And he said just a few words would fix that impression. His analysis has never been made better on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He says in the upper room on that day, they had already cast out devils. They had already done healings. They had already seen resurrection. It's not like the supernatural was unfamiliar to the apostles. What they received was an augmentation of those powers. But the unique new thing that came was the tongues of fire, which meant that they were endued with the power of divine utterance so that their words would fix an impression upon the minds of people. The new power was the amplified power of utterance so that their words fixed an impression on others. So that just a few words from Peter on the day of Pentecost was the result of 2,000 souls pierced in the heart. And Finney said that was what the endowment of power from on high did for him. It gave him an augmentation of the power so that when he was moving in the spirit and doing what God called him to do, just a few words would pierce themselves into the hearts of people and fix an impression that they could not escape. Made an impression right on them. So, uh, he said, but he would notice that the power would lift easily. He'd go about laboring and preaching, and he was so accustomed to seeing results that when he was wielding the sword and doing his job, and the trees weren't coming down and the altars weren't filled, he said he stopped and inquired as to why the power had lifted from him. Most of us live without the power. We're not even aware of that, 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 that threshold exists. But he was operating in it and could tell when it lifted. He said, invariably, I'd have to just set aside a day or two or three for some seeking God, fasting, a little prayer. He said, and the Holy Spirit would put his finger exactly on the thing that quenched the spirit, agreed the spirit, so that once I dealt with God on that one point, the power came back in all its freshness. He said, and this has been the experience of my entire life for 40 years in ministry. When I'm not having the effect I want to have, I pull back, I ask the Holy Spirit, what I, what's happening? And the Holy Spirit would say, you see this area over here? This is affecting you now. Adjust it. He would make the adjustment and the power came back. That's why last night's message was the pivotal, most important message for me for the new year. The Holy Spirit is trying to convince us and convict us of those little foxes that spoil the vine. It isn't always the big grotesque things, it's the little things, but it's in that adjustment that you align yourself with a fresh anointing so God can move in you and through you at a level you have not seen before. And if you suppress the voice of God in that, why would he trust you with other insight on other things? So the, uh, the idea that there's a, I got this whiteboard here and I haven't even used it yet, so let me, uh, let me use it. <laughs> Holy Ghost. All right, T take a look at, uh, how did the apostle Paul know in 2 Timothy? Go to 2 Timothy chapter three, speaking of these, these days we're in. And I'm telling you with great encouragement right now that the Spirit of God is dealing with a few things. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me while I was sitting in that front row and brought up something uh, that I got to deal with. And I'll do it when I, when, as, as soon as I get home. But the Lord brought it up two or three times. I didn't want to hear it. I want to hear God's voice on what I want to hear God's voice on. And God's talking about stuff I don't want to hear. I'm suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. I'm just like the sinner out there who doesn't want to hear something. I'm suppressing it. Why am I suppressing it? Because I don't like what I'm hearing. 
It's like, I don't want to watch that channel. I want to watch this channel. Here, God, talk to me on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> and God says, no. I'm not going to talk to you until you listen to, to what I'm trying to say. So I want to give you a picture now. I'm a big believer in pictures. Why am I a believer in pictures? Because I found something out. I found out that a single image or picture that properly encapsulates a concept increases your IQ 10% on that subject. That's the reason why I'm big on drawing illustrations, because you'll find this out. You, can, you ever notice how you can memorize lyrics to songs faster than you can memorize other things? Why? Because the melody somehow makes it memory permeable. It goes into your memory easier if it's attached to a melody. If it's attached to a visual, it's easier to recall the concept, hence the 10 point bump in IQ. So I start asking the Lord, how is it that Paul could say with such certitude in, uh, in, in, in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, know this, verse 1, in the last days, everybody say last days. Last days. All right, this is talking about us now. Perilous times will come. And what will be the primary first driving force of that perilous time? Men are going to become narcissistic selfie takers. <laughs> Men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. This is interesting. It's going to hit them when they're young, too. It's going to be an invasion of young people. Disobedient to parents means your parents are still alive. And uh, brutal, they're going to be disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control. This is quite a litany of characteristics, having a form of godliness but denying its power. What does that mean? having all the religious language and trappings, but denying the convicting power of the Holy Ghost on the conscience. They're always learning, heaping up for themselves teachers and knowledge, and, uh, but, but they're never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Well, what does the knowledge of the truth do? The knowledge of the truth sets you free. So they're constantly in bondage to stuff. They're never getting free, but they're accumulating more and more information. Now, as Jannies and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith. Who is he talking about here? Jannies and Jambres? Nope, you can't find them in the Bible. Go to the book of Exodus, you won't see them. The most that all my rabbinic scholars will tell me is that these were the names in the Jewish Talmud that refers to the sorcerers that withstood Moses in the courts of Pharaoh, which means these are political opponents that are trying to hinder the move of God when God wants to move. They were in the court of Pharaoh and they resisted Paul or they resisted uh, Moses. And so they cast down the serpents. You know, you should know your Bible story there where Aaron's rod gets thrown down. They, these advisors throw down their rods. They become serpents and Aaron's rod goes and swallows up all of theirs and he picks it up and they've lost their power. Their occult power. So what you're seeing is what's happening in Washington, D.C., is a combination of increased perversion by men of corrupt minds who have opened a portal to a spirit of perversion and false religion in America. The left is not a political ideology, it's a false religion. The sooner you get your head wrapped around that, the sooner you'll understand why they're going to come after the church, because you can't have two competing religions in America dominating legislation. So they're going to legislate out of their false religion. So Pharaoh, Jannies and Jambres, represent the merger of a cult political power opposing God's movement. And so you've you got to get involved with government and politics. Why? Because the government shall be upon Jesus' shoulders. And if uh, Jesus' shoulders, by the way, aren't the head. He's the head. The shoulders refer to the body of Christ. And the government shall be upon the body of Christ. Now, I know we don't like that message. We don't think about it. But since we're here, we might as well update our uh, technology to say, what is the church going to do until Jesus takes us out? Well, he wants you to occupy. How do you occupy? You're going to have to take dominion over the territory God assigned you. And as Janice and Jambres withstood Moses, Satan, will, when you hit the devil in your territory that God gave you, you're going to run into your version of Janice and Jambres. They're men of corrupt minds. They're rejected concerning the faith, but they will progress no further for their folly will be made manifest to all. I love that verse. There is a verse for victory in your battle because God doesn't say, well, just endure the contradiction, allow yourself to be martyred and go to heaven. He says, no, there's a, there's a position where you're in the movement of God. They will try to stop it 
and you will see them put to an open embarrassment when they try to do so. So I'm, I'm looking at all this and I say, Lord, how is it the Apostle Paul could speak with such certitude about in the last days? No. And I believe it's because he had a framework for the last days. And I'll, I'll build on it later, but I, I, was, I will submit to you that this is an accurate picture of how this looks. Jesus says, and I'm going to put the kingdom of heaven here and uh, we, we could teach this at some other point in time. But, you know, there's like third heaven. Paul's caught up the third heaven and heard unspeakable things things which could not be spoken. The best we can uh, we can understand is that spiritual wickedness is in heavenly places. The Apostle Paul says that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and power and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So those heavenly places. And then we have the earth realm down here. And then third heaven is going to be what we'll call the heaven of heavens or God's realm. So when Christ goes up to heaven, boom, to sit at the right hand of the father like that. That means that uh, there's a realm up there which is over this realm down here. This is going to be second heaven right there. And then we'll grab our blue pen for Earth's atmosphere down here. Now, I want you to see something. This is very important. We need to really look at this picture a little bit differently. Jesus says something. He says uh, that... uh, Luke 21, this is the verse the Lord gave me. He said, I want you to meditate upon Luke 21. What is God saying to us in these days of contradiction and days of challenges? Luke 21 and uh, verse 28. All right. Now, when these things begin to happen, all right, all right, let me go back here to 25, see the whole picture. There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth, distress of nations. Nations, notice, nations are going to shake. You're going to see more and more news about nations. With perplexity, the sea of the waves roaring and men's hearts, failing them for fear and the expectation of those things that are coming on the earth. A lot of people have an anxiety because of the things that are developing. But Jesus is saying, I don't want you to have the anxiety they had. Why? Because you know what's going on. Once you have the picture, you understand what's going on. Now, with these things, for they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now, what's coming right before that? The powers of the heavens will be shaken. You see the word plural there, heavens? That means that this entire realm here, earth and second heaven, is going to be shaken. Why do I know it's those two realms that are going to be shaken? Why do I know that this is the heavens, plural, that is being spoken of? Because we are receiving up here, we are receiving, look at this, an unshakable kingdom. So if you are receiving the unshakable kingdom, that means the unshakable kingdom is putting pressure on the heavens and causing Satan's thrones and dominions to be pushed out of place and they're being forced down and that's why there's a shaking on the earth. In other words, if you had inside information that the Allies were going to be arriving at Normandy and you had your little chalet there in France and suddenly you hear boom, 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 boom and the earth's shaking, you wouldn't be going, oh my God, all hell's breaking loose. You'd be going, the invasion's begun. Because D-Day was about the invasion of Fortress Europe with uh, an armada that was coming to remove Hitler from power. The shaking that's going on on the earth is heaven coming back to take over the earth and Satan's being removed from power. One, just a shift in your paradigm can change the way you look at the news every day. Instead of being frequently traumatized by the latest development, You start going, oh, the invasion. Heaven's invasion is already moving. Oh, this would be interesting. What is the Father doing today? So Jesus goes on to say the powers of the heavens are being shaken. The powers, principalities and powers are being shaken here. And they're being shaken and they're losing their control over nations down here. Watch this. Jesus said, now when these things begin, in the early dawn of the first boom, boom, on the beach of Normandy. Then look up and lift up your heads because your redemption 
is coming to a theater near you. Now, this is very important. I got like four minutes here. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a, an important uh, word here. And the Greek word for, in this word for draws nigh. Lift up for your redemption draws nigh or draws near. Now that word is uh, engidzo. It's pronounced engidzo. That's the phonetic. But the, the word literally means geographically and on a calendar. So for instance, we know Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Everybody knows Jesus is coming. But in our mind, he's way out there. And the Antichrist is getting closer and closer and the world's getting darker and darker and it's getting freaker and freaker. And I sure hope the Lord comes back really fast. And it's like, he's way out there and we know he's going to be coming or we're going to be going. That's about, that's our theology. How about this picture? How about the word draws near means physically God is geographically getting closer every day as the day dawns. The reason why the shaking is happening is because heaven is invading hell's domain and shaking the earth. Draws near... Curious enough, same Greek word when in Luke chapter 7, verse 12, and when Jesus and Gizzo drew near the gate of the city, there was a boy on a stretcher, who a, a funeral uh, pile was coming by. And as Jesus drew near, he came near and overlapped a funeral. He got in proximity with the dead child and Jesus' celebration bumped into a funeral and he goes up and raises the kid from the dead and everybody joins the prayer. That's where this verse is used. It means drawing near means physical proximity. Heaven is closer now than it's ever been before because God is returning. He's literally coming back. Does this make sense to you? So you got to get, you got to get that the word draws near is geographic. It's physical proximity. Heaven is close. The reason you don't feel it is because Darkness is covering the earth. Why is darkness covering? Because Satan's getting pushed down. There's a thicker layer of darkness on the earth. So you're going to have to develop your spiritual muscle to break through it because heaven's closer than hell is. Because heaven's on the inside of you. Does this make sense? You got God on the inside of you, but you got a radio signal getting jammed up even more intensely by the enemy. But God is even closer than ever before, which is why the enemy is freaking out. Does this make sense to you? And I can show you in Haggai chapter 2, where the voice of the Lord shakes the heavens and the earth and the nations. It's the voice of the Lord. Why? Because heaven is coming to invade earth. And because of that, the earth is shaking. Now, your challenge is darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness to people, but upon you, dun -dun, my light shall come. God's going to break through this realm here and cause his light to be upon his people so that the people of God exhibit the power of the age to come as a, dark, as a stark contrast with the powers of hell all around. We're going to be put on display. That's the reason why you have to listen to the voice of your conscience to make those little adjustments so that the power of God can come upon you with all the freshness that's necessary to fix an impression upon the hearts and minds of others. Does that make sense? He's building a glorious house. And I'll show it to you in my next session. I'll, I'll amplify this. The key idea I want you to get is that heaven is coming close in terms of look up. Your redemption is drawing nigh on the calendar. The word means close on the schedule and close in geographic proximity. The reason why you're seeing the end time shaking of nations and economies isn't because the devil is taking over, it's because the devil is being cast out. And so in my last 40 seconds, everybody messes up Revelation 12. I'm not gonna try to undo it for you now. But I'm going to tell you, every chapter in the Bible is about the future, except when the theologians run into Revelation 12. When they run into Revelation 12, they all get strange. Well, this one chapter has nothing to do with the future. Oh, yes, it does. Everything in the book of Revelation has to do with what those things that are coming upon the earth. And how does it wrap up? It says that Satan, at some point, gets cast out of his ability to hold this territory. Just like Hitler lost his ability to keep them out of Europe. Once they landed, he was backing up to Berlin. 
there's going to be an occupation of this realm by the forces of heaven. Revelation 12 says that God's going to occupy and Satan's going to be cast out who deceives the whole world is going to be cast out his angels with him because there's no more place for them. Meaning he will be dispossessed. In my opinion, that's when you'll see the greater tribulation come down here when Satan no longer has occupation of that realm. He's forced down here and it says he's come down to the earth with great wrath because he knows he only has three and a half years left, a short time. Does that make sense to you? I'm telling you, it may be a, maybe the first, it's like when I talked about Donald Trump, it may have been hard to swallow the first time I said, there's the guy God anointed. But I'm telling you, the last days is going to be the time when Satan is being pushed out of his position in the heavenlies. Nations are going to be in upheaval because the system down here that's attached to that system here is going to be totally unstable. What will not shake will be the people of God occupying the territory God gave his people because you're plugged into that. So when you hear a preacher talk about an offering, as Andrew did, uh, you know, convincingly last night, and say, listen, your economy isn't defined by inflation cycles or, or recessions or depression. He's absolutely right, because if your economy is plugged into third heaven, it's an unshaken economy. Your supply line is unshakable. Your circumstances, investment portfolio and, uh, and, and, you know, litigations and laws and stuff, that'll be all, all shaken up because it's got man involved. But your, your economy, just like your peace of mind, just like your anointing, just like your healing, is hooked up to an unshakable realm. Make sure you're building on this blueprint where the unshakable schematics come from. So that you're excavating the territory God gave you on a rock that will not shake. The floods have already begun. The shaking's already started. But see that you aren't shook up because the kingdom of heaven is coming to a theater near you. Thank you. Amen. I'm down to zero on that screen. <laughs> when it goes to zero, I stop. Amen. Praise God. Man, did you enjoy Lance this morning? <laughs> He's going to be ministering this evening at uh, seven is when the service starts and he'll be ministering in the second session tomorrow morning. So you got two more opportunities. And I mean, who wouldn't want to come back and see this? It just amazes me that this helps anybody's IQ. <laughs> but whatever works, amen. So anyway, Lance is a super blessing. We're going to take a break here for about 12 minutes. Let's be back at 10 minutes till, and we'll start the next session. Uh, please take care of everything you need to do. Remember, we got materials, and Lance has materials out there too. Please go check them out. Be back in 12 minutes and we'll start our next session. Also, we're going to have our prayer ministers down here. If I could get our prayer ministers to come down front. If there's anyone who needs prayer, uh, please come and let us help you any way we can. So let me just remind you again that we've got a meeting coming up immediately after this session talking about our Karis Bible College. Julie, are you gonna promote this or who do I ask? This is Julie Harris. I don't and think anybody's paying attention to it. Well, they're, they're going to. Are they going to? So uh, anyway, Julianne, Julianne came to us and uh, man, God just changed her life. You've been involved in a lot of different things. She does some of our hosting on some of our broadcasts. So many of you may have seen her. And uh, anyway, now you are in the recruiting department of yes, Karis Bible College. Yes, I am a recruiter for Karis Bible College uh, because my life was so radically transformed by the word of God. So what's going to happen at the meeting? What okay, are you so be doing? we want you to come r exactly right after the meeting. It's going to be right across the hallway. You'll see signs. We want you to come there. You're going to hear from the vice presidents 
um, of Karis Bible College. So Mike and Carrie will be there and they'll share a little bit and then we'll just go over your options. Um, you know, I love how Andrew says, if you have a desire, an inkling of Karis Bible College, it's not the devil, right? And so we just encourage you in that direction. We give you your next step because sometimes we want to know the end from the beginning and God doesn't work that way. He works with us in steps. And so we just show you what your next step could be, and then you can just go from there. Yeah, if the Lord, uh, you know, speaks to you about step one, and you're waiting until you understand how it's going to work out step 10, God's not going to show you everything. Amen. Because it makes you just responsible for more. He'll just show you things one step at a time. Amen. And that's what we see with Karis Bible College, because a lot of times we're like, well, my family, my job. You know, you want to have everything worked out in your mind before you make that next step. And God's just saying, just take a step in that direction and then see what I'll do. So Amen. that's what we do. I heard a couple of testimonies yesterday about people that the Lord told them to sign up for school. And they did. And they had no idea how it was going to be paid for. And both of them had the entire year paid for by somebody else. Yeah. But only after they stepped out. That's it. And that's, that's our God, right? You got to get out of the boat before you walk on the water. Amen. And exactly. Man, that's deep. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. All right. So uh, I've asked uh, Ashley Teredes if he would come up and receive this morning's offering. <clears throat> and I don't know how many of you know Ashley, but Ashley and his wife, Carly, uh, I meant them. How many years ago has it been now? It's um, 2006. So what was that? That was 16, Six, 16 17, 17 years ago. 17 years ago. Flies. They brought their little daughter who was dying, and uh, she wasn't expected to live through the week. She got totally healed, both of them, and their both sets of grandparents came to our UK school. Then they moved over here to the U.S. and did third year. And you worked for me for, what, 10 years? Yeah, just over 10 years, I think, yeah. 10 years. And now they are out on their own. And Ashley and Carly are going to be speaking with me in Orlando in February. Ooh. They're going to be the guest speakers there. And you're going to love it. But anyway, I'm on their board. And it is phenomenal what God is doing. This little girl that was healed 17 years ago now just had a baby this week. Amen. And uh, she wasn't expected to live through the week. And so we're joined at the heart forever. And Ashley's a blessing. So he's going to receive this morning. Amen. Talk. Thank you, Andrew. That's awesome. So I want to do the business side first. So if you can hand out the envelopes, we're taking up an offering for Andrew Romack Ministries. So if, you've, uh, if you need envelopes, can the ushers hand those envelopes out? I like to give people a lot of time to write because a million takes a long time to write. A lot of ours, not of ours. So hand those on. That's not even that funny anymore because Andrew does have million dollar gifts, praise God, to this ministry. And we'll probably get billion dollar gifts at one point. That's what we need, about a billion to do what as, uh, the Lord's put in Andrew's heart. So unless you've got over a billion to give today, then Andrew Womack Ministries has designated that they know exactly what they're going to do with it and they're going to extend the kingdom around the earth, praise God, like never before. And I believe what, what Brother Lance was talking about, how what's happening at Caris Bible College and what's happening through Andrew Romick Ministries is the, I'm telling you what, it's one of the, it's if not the, I'm biased, I'm a Caris graduate, so I'll just say, it, it's the best place you can be right now in this move of God, amen, it's, it's powerful. So you don't even need a word from God to come to Caris, just come. I didn't have a word from God to come to Caris, but then I look back and I know 100% it was God's will for me to go to Caris Bible College back in 2006. So I would say if you have any type of desire to come to Caris Bible College, then it would be a good thing. But I'm not here for Caris. I'm here to take up the offering, praise God. So um, I want to tell you a few things. First of all, if you're uh, making your checks out, make them to Angel Romack Ministries or AWMI. You can give on them envelopes with cash. You can give with credit cards, debit cards, uh, car keys, jewelry, gold bars, whatever you want to give. We'll take it. Some of you are listening. We'll take it, praise the Lord. God loves a cheerful giver. So let's laugh when we give it. It's amazing when we do the offerings, people get all like worried about it and they start crossing their arms or conveniently have to go to the bathroom. I love the offering. The offering is my favorite part of the service. I love to give because God's, God's not trying to get from us. He's trying to get more to us. And when you understand that and you understand the power of giving, you know what Andrew's been teaching on uh, last night and I believe he's going to continue teaching on it and Brother Lance taught some on it as well is hearing God's voice. And, you know, I believe there's a competing voice in our life. And I believe it's one of the reasons why we can't hear God's voice so well. In, in uh, Matthew 6, you know, the last half of Matthew 6, it's some of the best teaching on finances. 
and uh, stewardship and how we should handle money. And in Matthew 6, verse 24, Jesus makes it very plain. He says, you cannot serve God and mammon. If you notice, he didn't say you cannot serve God and the devil. That would be easy. Who wants to serve the devil? I shouldn't ask that because some people aren't listening, so they just put their hand up automatically. <laughs> it's embarrassing. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. But no one wants to serve the devil, right? So it's, it's easy. God and the devil is easy. But when it comes to God and mammon, that gets a little bit harder because we need mammon, we need money in our life to be able to live on this earth. Because I don't want any money. Well, how are you going to live? How are you going to get the gospel out? How you, we, we should want money so that we can have something to give. We should want money because it creates influence. And people get all self-righteous, like, I don't want any of that money. I don't want that filthy lucre. Well, give it to me. Give it to Andrew. We'll put it in the gospel. Praise the Lord. <laughs> because the money, money can be, money's amoral. Money's neither good or bad, but it can be used for good. So if we put money to work, you've heard of the golden rule, right? He who has all the gold makes all the rules. So if the body of Christ has the money, we can actually do more for the Lord and establish his covenant. Deuteronomy 8, 18, we can establish his covenant on earth. So we should want money in the body of Christ. We should want money in our lives so that we can put it for good. Because if I have a lot of money, I'll just be greedy. No, if you're greedy, you're just going to be amplified greedy with more money. If you're a giver, you're just going to give more when you have more money. So anyway, so mammon, and, mammon and, and God is the conflicting voices. And what happens is we hear the voice of mammon rather than hearing the voice of God. And I believe this is one of the main ways we miss the voice of God or don't hear the voice of God is because the voice of mammon is speaking to us. Let me give you a little test. If, if you, you make a decision, what's the biggest voice in your head when you make a major decision? Is it just the Lord and you, just, you pray and you fast or do what you do to hear God's voice and you hear God's voice telling you to do something? Is the first thing you think about is how am I going to pay for it? How am I going to afford it? So many people come to me and say, I'd love to get a Caris Bible College, but I'm only two years away from retirement and I'm going to get this bonus or I don't think I can live in Colorado, the cost of living is too high or whatever the excuses are, it's monetary decisions they're thinking about. And what happens is though that mammon talks to us in our heads and we stop hearing the voice of God because we hear the voice of mammon saying, you can't afford to do that. If you give this amount of money away, how are you going to get that money back again? I've been there so many times. It is funny now because I'm on the other side of it, but there's probably other times when I'm going to have to do it again. But we've been so many times we've had to give everything away. And that's the type of gets your attention. You know, Andrew talked about her daughter Hannah in 2006. She was given one week to live, maximum two weeks. So the doctor sent her home. She was three years old. She was the size of a nine-month-old baby. She was, so, she was so stunted in her growth. She couldn't eat any food. She was, uh, she was wasting away. They'd, give, they'd tried everything they could in Great Ormond Street, a great children's hospital. They tried everything they could, but they couldn't do anything. And they sent her home to die. But we didn't take her home. We drove across the other side of England and we brought her to a conference like this. And um, we brought her to a conference and she was prayed for. And when she woke up, she was in a stroller at the time. She was on a machine that was feeding her 23 hours a day. When she woke up, um, we told her, Jesus has healed you. And she said, I want to eat. She'd never eaten before. She started eating, kept eating, didn't stop eating. We took her back to the hospital and the doctors kept looking at her. They, they wanted to find something wrong. I love doctors, but they wanted to find something wrong. They were type of disappointed. They said, man, we've tried, but we can't find one thing wrong with you, Hannah. You're 100% well. Praise Jesus. Amen. And that was uh, 2006. And now she got married in April, which broke my heart. But she made up for it. She made a great godly man, a Caris graduate, actually. But she made up for it because she gave me a grandson just two days ago, I think. Two days ago, praise God. So I'm a grandpa now. They said, what are you going to be called? Grandpa? I said, no, I'm going to teach this child the English accent. <laughs> because how impressed would you be if you saw a two-year-old come along and say, grandfather? Wouldn't that be impressive? <laughs> so I want him to call me grandfather. I'm not going to say look. I'm going to say behold. Behold the birds. But anyway, <laughs> it's quite funny actually because she gave birth... The baby was two months early, so he's in NICU right now. So he's fine. He's, he's going to be fine, but he's, in, he's all wired up in the machines. Bless him. He's only four pounds, but they're very happy with him and everything else. She gave birth two months early, but it does mean that she gave birth eight months after she got married. <laughs> so as a godly family, she's going to get a hard time about that. But anyway, I say all that to say, the reason why I told that story is because the night before Hannah was healed, the Lord spoke to me in my heart. And I'd been listening to Andrew's ministry about two or three weeks before. Then we were born again, spirit-filled. We loved the Lord. But we didn't know the truth of the gospel. We didn't know that God was a good God. And this ministry is teaching people that. This ministry is teaching people the true nature of God. I think one of the greatest travesties in the body of Christ is God gets blamed for bad things. And we thought, well, if it's God's will for our daughter to be healed, she'll be healed. If it's not God's will to be, for her to be healed, she won't be healed. That's a terrible doctrine. 
That means you're, you know, anyway, so Andrew taught us. We listened to his website, listened to his free tapes for like three and a half weeks. We got a crash course on the goodness of God. And then we came to one of his meetings, which was just like this in England. And we sat there and I was praying and it was time for the offering. I thought, well, I've received a lot from this, this man of God. I've received a lot from this ministry. Have you know, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. It says, if you've received spiritual things, you should sow material things. It's the way God set it up. It's the way you concrete in your heart. It's the way you it, it just sow material things. is so powerful when you receive spiritually. So I thought, I've received spiritually from Andrew. I want to give materially. So I just prayed one of those prayers. Have you done this? I was like, how much shall I give, Lord? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me dead clear. He said, everything you got. I said, I can't hear you, Lord. I was like, must be the devil talking to me. This cannot be God. And I said, Lord, are you sure? Let us, re let us reason together, Lord. Let us Can we talk about this? And, he said, and, and here's the thing. God doesn't tempt us with evil, but he does tempt us with good. The, the Lord tempts us with good. He'll tempt you with good. He'll tempt you. Would you want to come a little higher with me? Do you want to go on a little adventure with me? Do you want to trust me even more? Do you want to walk by faith even more? He'll tempt you with those good things. So it wasn't like he was saying, you must do this. But he told me, give everything you've got. And it took me a few minutes to calm down. I stopped shaking. I'm trying to add up everything we've got in the bank accounts and stuff, savings account, checking account, I mean everything. So I turned to Carly. I said, Carly, this is before Hannah was healed. I said, Carly, I think the Lord's telling us to give everything we've got. She said, are you sure? I said, I'm about 90% sure. She said, that's good enough for me. She's like, she loves that. She was like, it's not her responsibility to provide anyway. So it's like, it's no problem. I do think my, it's harder for men sometimes. Women are like, oh, no problem. But for me, I was the main breadwinner. So I was like, how are we going to do this? But I prayed. You know what we did? We, I wrote the check out. I worked out everything we had. Savings account, checking account. I just gave everything we had right there. Now, I wasn't paying for Hannah's healing. I wasn't bribing God. I wasn't trying to make something happen. The Lord prompted me to do that. And here's the thing. I realized I was trusting in mammon rather than trusting God. I was trusting in the voice of mammon rather than the voice of God. And God wanted my whole heart. God wants our whole hearts today. He wants us so that when we hear his voice, we hear his voice rather than hearing the voice of mammon. And the next day she was miraculously healed. And praise God, she's 100% well. So my point being this. God wants us to hear his voice clearly. And I believe mammon, money, is something, because we have to live with it every day, is something that can distract us very easily. You know, one time I was at a, a banquet, a missions banquet, and the Lord told me we'd been saving up money. we just moved to America. We'd been saving up money for a down payment on a house. We saved up $10,000 to buy our first house in America. And I'm at this missions banquet, and as I'm walking out of the banquet, the Lord spoke to me clearly in my heart and said, that $10,000, turn around and give that to that missionary. Again, I was like, oh, no, no, Lord, please, please. Can we reason together, please? It was tough on my flesh. But I knew it was the voice of God. So I turned around and gave it to the missionary. He was crying. As I gave him the check, I was crying. I, was like, I, mean, I mean, it took me months to save up money to buy a house. I was like, oh, no. And, and, and my flesh is thinking, and the enemy saying, you're never going to get a house in America. You've blown it. You've saved, you took you months and months to save up that money. Now it's all gone. Don't worry about that. That's just the flesh and your devil. The truth is God never takes. He's always trying to get more to you, right? So that was exactly what that missionary needed to finish building his Bible school in Asia. And he finished building his Bible school. He's seen hundreds of students graduate through his Bible school. Powerful. But I got in my truck and I started to drive home. And I was thanking God. I was like, thank you, Lord, for the, for the honor of giving into your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for the honor of being able to give into your kingdom. And the presence of the Lord filled my truck right there. I had to pull over. And he said this word to me. He said, thank you, Ashley. And in that one word when he said thank you, it meant so much. And, and what he explained to me was, he said, I tried to get that $10,000 to that missionary so many times, but people couldn't hear me. And I was like, really? And, I, and he said, yeah, people can't hear me. I've told them, give, give $10,000, give $10,000. And they just couldn't, even, it wasn't even on their radio. He said, you've had it on your radio. You've been praying about giving big and, and everything else. It was on your radio. You could hear my voice. And guess what happened? It was just a few years later, we owned a house for cash. We didn't even need a down payment, praise God. So God's always trying to get more to us, amen? He's not trying to take from us. But we must understand that this competing voice in our life is Matthew 6, 24. It's either God or mammon. And if you want to know what mammon sounds like, we won't go there now for time, but if you want to know what mammon sounds like, go to, um, what is it, Mark 4, 19, and Jesus explains what mammon is. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust for other things. That's the voice of mammon in your life. Whenever you make a decision, when you want to hear God more. So how do you hear God clearer? Give, trust him with your money, and say, you know what? God's my master, not mammon. And every time you give, you're putting mammon in its place. You're saying, mammon, I could do lots of other things with this money. My flesh wants me to keep this money. But I'm going to give it into the kingdom. And what you're doing is you're, you're concreting the fact that God's the strongest voice in your life. And the more you do that, the softer your heart will come to go, towards God. I don't know a man of faith in the body of Christ right now who's walking in the supernatural that's not a giver. 
I don't know, I don't know, but man of God in my life, I've got lots of mentors in my life, I'm so grateful, but I don't know, Andrew Womack's the greatest mentor, and he's, he's the most generous person I've ever met. Why do you think he's got a multi-million dollar, hundred million dollar ministry, and doing all what he's doing around the world, is because he's giving from day one. He gave when it hurt. People say, it's okay for Andrew to give, his ministry's so big. No, he was giving away from his ministry when it really hurt him to give, in the natural. Giving free tapes away. How many of you ever received a free material from Andrew Wright Ministries? Praise God, look at that. Giving away free. There was a time when he couldn't afford in the natural to do that, but he did it anyway. We give and what happens? Then the increase comes. And then one last thing, if you're not a partner, if you are a partner of Andrew Wright, who's a partner of Andrew Wright Ministries? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Your partnership enables miracles like my daughter to be healed. Your partnership, because you're getting the truth into people's ears. You're getting the truth into people's hands. The website is free to use. It's not free to Andrew Wright Ministries. These conferences, it's free to you, but it's not free to Andrew Wright Ministries. All the things you're consuming, materials, television, all the different things that they're doing at the moment, they're not free. They're free gifts to you, but they're not free. So partners are making this happen. So thank you so much for your partnership of Andrew Wright Ministries. Thank you, Andrew, for letting us partner with you. And if you're not a partner of Andrew Wright Ministries, I said this a few months ago and I got in trouble, but I'll say it again. If you're not a partner of Andrew Wright Ministries, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Come and meet me and tell me your excuse when you're not a partner. You can start a partnership at any amount. You can, you can do it as a small amount as you want. But guess what's going to happen? When you start partnering with a ministry like Andrew Wright Ministries, that, that finances you give is going to start increasing. And as it starts increasing, you're going to be able to partner more and give more, praise God. So I'm so excited about what's happening for Andrew Wright Ministries and Caris Bible College. I'm telling you what, it's so powerful and we get to be a part of it. So I want to encourage you today, give big, give by faith. And you know when you're giving big because your flesh will freak out. If you were writing your check and your handshakes, that's because you're giving generously, praise God. And guess what? God is not out giving. When you give generously, you're going to reap generously. 2 Corinthians 9, when you give generously, you're going to reap generously. So give generously today, praise God. Your money can bring you things, your giving can bring you things money could never buy. Your giving can bring you things money could never buy. I could not pay for my daughter's healing, but my giving moved my heart into a place where I could receive that miracle for her. Your giving can give you things and bring you things money could never buy. Praise God. Let's pray over the offering. Father God, I thank you for this offering, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that this offering is anointed, Lord. I thank you, Lord, it's blessed. I thank you, Lord, that every penny that goes into Andrew Romick Ministries is going to the gospel, Lord. We're seeing people's lives set free. Lord, I thank you for hundreds of thousands of people set free through this offering right now in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, lives here being changed as people so big, as people so by faith. I thank you, Lord, that their hearts are being moved. I thank you, Lord, that you're taking them to new places, increase, new opportunities, promotions, new business ideas. I thank you, Lord, this is a wealthy group of people here right now in Arizona, praise God. In, in January 2023, I declare you are, being, you are wealthy, you are increasing, you are prosperous because you're believing and trusting the Lord. I thank you, Lord, it's your will for us to prosper financially so that we can get your kingdom out, praise God, and help more people around the world. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. You can receive the offering. Stay up here just a second, Ashley. So Ashley, uh, the way that they got hold of our ministry was they were taking Hannah to the hospital and they had to rent a car. And, oh, you got a gift here. We don't want to miss this gift. And uh, they rented a car that didn't have a CD player. It only had a cassette player. And so they went to uh, Carly's mom and dad and said, do you have a cassette tape? And tell, tell the story about how they got that cassette tape. So they, they had a cassette tape given to them from a friend of theirs who was a partner of yours. And when was the tape recorded? It was in Louisiana, right? Do you remember? Oh, it was the 90s. It was probably 15 years before you it was, heard it. it was the, you said it was early 90s. Yeah, it was so Early time. 90s. So the tape was recorded. Then it was sent as a partner gift. So the, the partners of yours in England. And then that partner gave it to my mother-in-law. And they just put it in their junk drawer. You know, I don't know about in America, but in England we have junk drawers, right? It was one drawer in the kitchen. We just throw everything, like old batteries and things like that. So it was in the junk drawer. So I said to her, hey, have you got any cassette tapes, any, any teaching tapes? So she looked around and she found a couple and one of them was an Andrew Romack cassette tape, an old white cassette tape. I still have that tape to this day. And we put that tape in and that tape had about an hour and a half of teaching on it. And Andrew says that and he remembers teaching that message. I remember because that message. It was like 10 minutes on everything. It was like 10 minutes on the better way to pray, 10 minutes on you've already got it, 10 minutes of God wants you well. I taught everything I know on that one tape. It was awesome. <laughs> it was awesome, praise God. So anyway. And, and the daddy-in-law uh, didn't like my voice. He I, couldn't stand it. And so he just threw it in this drawer. You never listened to it because of your voice. It was yeah. a hindrance. I don't know what's wrong with accents. Yeah. But uh, it's... it's <laughs> It was a hindrance. So that tape was sent by a partner gift 
Just think what that's done, and not only our daughter's life, but all the other lives we've seen healed and we've seen set free, praise God, through, through what we're doing. So and I'm telling you, that one tape is amazing. It's and I remember amazing. the night that Hannah got healed. Ashley was just praising God, and he had Hannah on his shoulders dancing around. And as he came by the front, I recognized her, you know, and him, that we'd pray for him. And I said, so what happened? He got up and gave the testimony about her going out. She had never eaten and she went out and ate, what was it? Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> She'd never told her, eaten solid food. What would you like to life? eat? And she said, I want McDonald's. That's the power of advertising, I guess. I said, that will kill a well person. So we went around <laughs> looking for McDonald's, but we couldn't find McDonald's. We found KFC. So the very first meal of solid food our daughter ever ate was fried chicken and fries and brownies. I mean, this is not, do not do this unless God tells you to do it. <laughs> and, and she was 100%. She was absolutely fine. And uh, in fact, she started to choke up one time uh, on the way back to the conference and you know that teaching the authority of the believer just came back to my heart and I, I turned around and I said choking stop right now in Jesus name and it stopped and we had to do that a couple of times but other than that so, and so I, I remember when Ashley got up to give the testimony he just stopped in the middle of it and this touched me so much but he he said to all of you who are partners he says my daughter is alive because some partner enabled Andrew to send a free tape 20 years before that laid in a drawer dormant for 15, 20 years. And it was our partners that made that happen. Amen. So, Amen. man, I just want to thank, I want to thank those of you. You know, we quit counting at over 200 million free tapes, books, CDs that we gave away. And this isn't including our website that we have a million free downloads on that per month, but we have given away over 200 million free books, CDs. Our partners enable us to do that. Yes, and your daughter is alive and now has a little baby Amen. because of what our partners did. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, partners. You may, this is a great team. You're teaching, you're giving it away, and the partners are enabling you to do that. That's this awesome. is a great team, praise God. So thank you, everyone. So if you aren't a partner, why aren't you? That's right. What's wrong with you? Become a partner. <laughs> You don't like, oh, I knocked my thing loose. This is a puny little deal. You'd think with all the money, you know, with all the money that we spend, we could get one that works. <laughs> Would you fix that, man? <laughs> Thank you. Excuse me while I dress here. <laughs> all right. I tell you, I just praise God for all he's enabled us to do. Most of you are, don't, don't know me real well and stuff, but you know, we had uh, uh, Jerry White come up and Herman and, I mean, uh, yeah, Herman, what am I thinking of? Hector. Hector. Hector and Mimi Torres came up. Man, I was here 40 years ago and they had me come and they've known me a long time. And Jamie and I were so poor back then, we couldn't pay attention. <laughs> and now God has increased the ministry and we're doing things. And it's exactly like what Ashley was saying. Uh, man, we've just given, we've trusted God, believed God, and it'll work for anybody. It'll work for anybody. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm teaching on how to hear the voice of God, and I was going to teach on five ways. I only have four sessions. I've already blown it the first night. I spent the whole night talking about how he speaks to us through our conscience. And so <clears throat> today I've made an adjustment. I'm going to talk about four ways to hear the voice of God. <laughs> And actually, I could teach on what I want to share right now. I could teach on this for the rest of the weekend and probably over a week because I've got a series entitled A Sure Foundation. I've got a series entitled Effortless Change. I've got a series entitled Plain is Dirt. I've got a series entitled uh, The Word Became Flesh. And all of these are multiple series with four or five teachings in each one. And basically it's all talking about how that the number one way outside, the most common way that God speaks to people is through the conscience. And even people that don't know the Lord have a conscience and you can't 
uh, just ignore that. That is one of the ways that God speaks to us. So that is the most common way. But for a person who's born again, who gets born again, the Lord speaks to us through his word. And this has to be the foundation. I'm going to be talking about other things, how God can speak to you very specifically. But the word is the foundation and it's like the plumb line. It's the thing that you check everything else that you say God has spoken to you. It has to measure up with the word of God. And let me just start by sharing this testimony. Uh, This morning, Jamie was singing that song about how great thou art. And it made me think back that that was my dad's favorite song. And at his funeral, just a couple of weeks after I turned 12 years old, I was uh, at the funeral and that's when they had, you know, the casket, an open casket. And I was standing there just about four or five feet away from looking at my dad's body. And, and the pastor was up singing, How Great Thou Art. And it just seemed so weird to me because I had fasted and prayed for about six months that my dad would be healed and yet he died. And so here they were talking about how great God was and yet it looked like that God didn't answer my prayers. And I remember as a 12 year old boy standing there watching my dad's body as they sang that song thinking, God, if you're really great, reveal yourself to me. What is your purpose for my life? And so I prayed that as a 12 year old boy and I really believe that what God has done in my life, that that's my prayer that he answered. But did you know I was 18, it was 12 years or six years later when the Lord actually, when I encountered him, but let me back up just a bit, 18 months before that, I was getting ready to graduate from high school and they started having career days and saying, what do you want to do with your life? And I've always believed that God had a purpose for my life. I could spend an hour or two teaching on this, but God has a purpose for every one of us. Psalms 139, before we were even formed in our mother's belly, he had already written in his book, all of our days were written out. He has a plan for every one of us. I've always believed that, but I just didn't know what the plan was. And when I was getting ready to graduate from high school, I started having to make decisions about what was I going to do. And so I really started seeking the Lord about what is your purpose for my life? I was wanting to hear God's voice. I was wanting God to speak to me. And I went to the pastor of our church. I went to a number of people and asked them, how do you hear the voice of God? And nobody could tell me. It was basically similar to the way that most people talk about how do you know the right one to marry? Oh, you know, you'll just feel something. You'll just know the planets will line up or something. Nobody could tell you how to do it. And so <clears throat> my senior year in high school, I, I bought a um, Matthew Henry's commentary, five volumes of commentary, and I read every verse in the Bible. I read through the entire Bible and looked up every verse and read Matthew Henry's commentary on it. Now, I don't necessarily recommend that because it's not a spirit-filled commentary, but nonetheless, what I'm saying is I got serious figuring that somewhere in this Bible, there had to be my answer. And for 18 months, I just read through scripture. I would stay up until two or three o'clock in the morning and at four o'clock, I had a... uh, Uh, paper route that I threw when I was in high school. And so I was getting two or three hours of sleep a night, just studying the word, looking, God, what is your purpose for my life? How do I find out what you want me to do? And I remember I had one of these gooseneck uh, lamps that, you know, you could bend the lamp and I would put my Bible down and read like that because I'd get sleepy. And when I fell asleep, my head had hit that thing and it'd burn it and it'd wake me up. (laughs) But that's how hungry I was. I didn't want to sleep. I wanted to find out what God's purpose for my life was. And, you know, I came across a scripture in Romans chapter 12. What I'm talking about is I was wanting to hear the voice of God. How does God speak to you? He can speak to you through creation. He can speak to you through your conscience. He can speak to you in an audible voice. He spoke to Balaam uh, through a donkey. I mean, God could have a bird come land on your shoulder and talk to you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that stuff because if you hear an audible voice out of heaven, most of you will probably know that's God. 
I'm going to talk about some more subtle ways. And God, he said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. God can speak to you in an audible voice. He could hit you with a bolt of lightning. God can do things that take no faith, but that's not what pleases God. The dominant ways that God wants to speak to you is in these subtle ways that it takes faith for you to receive. And so anyway, I was just studying and praying in Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. Boy, when I read that, it's just like God lit a fire on the inside of me. In Luke chapter 24, the two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus, Jesus walked with them for seven miles and talked to them. And they said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked to us by the way? Jeremiah said the same thing in Jeremiah chapter 20, I believe it's verse nine. He had made a decision. He was gonna quit speaking in the name of the Lord because he had been persecuted and criticized so much. He just says, I'm not gonna talk anymore in the name of the Lord. And he says, but his word was like fire shut up in my bones and I couldn't forbear and I had to speak. I tell you, the word of God is alive. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, the word of God is quick, alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. When God goes to speaking to you, how do you discern if this is God or if this is me? The word of God is what discerns. It's alive. And anyway, I was studying and just looking for 18 months, I was just praying, God, what is your purpose for my life? And when I got to Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And man, I've spent two and three hours ministering on that verse. There is a lot. For about four and a half months, when I saw this, I just took those verses and I thought about them constantly praying. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? What does it mean that this is a reasonable service? One of the translations says it's your normal Christian duty. And then in verse two, Romans chapter 12, verse two, he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. The Greek word for transform there is the Greek word metamorpho. It's where we get the word metamorphosis from. Be transformed like a caterpillar spins a cocoon and comes out a butterfly through the renewing of your mind. And the last part of that verse says that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And man, when I read that, that's what I had been after for 18 months. God, what do you want me to do? And it said right there that you do this and you will know the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And so to me, that I'm talking about how do you hear God's voice? Yes, you have a conscience and you don't violate your conscience. You have an intuitive knowledge of what's right and wrong and certainly you go by that. But man, the word of God is given for us to be able to renew our mind and God will quicken the word of God to you and speak to you through the word. And when you do that, man, that's what transforms everything. So for four months from December of 1967 until March the 23rd of 1968, all I did was meditate on Romans 12, one and two. God, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Help me to be a living sacrifice. Help me to renew my mind, to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And then I had an experience and again, we're talking about how to hear God's voice. How does God speak to you? Uh, man, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed right now. I could say so many things to you, but I don't have that much time to say it. Man, you need to get all of this stuff that God's shown me. It, it'd really make a difference in your life. But I, I had the Lord show up in a prayer meeting. And on Saturday night, I was praying with a group of my friends. We would pray every Saturday night from 10 o'clock until 11 o'clock. And that'll give you an idea of how religious I was. At 18 years old, this is what I did on Saturday nights was get together with my friends and we prayed. That's what all of you did, right? <laughs> and anyway, we were in this prayer meeting. It's a long story, but God showed up. I don't know how to explain this, 
But God showed up. I didn't physically see anything. I didn't audibly hear anything. But I was in the presence of God. The glory of God showed up. And I had become a religious Pharisee. I'd been born again for 10 years. I got born again when I was 8 years old. I had been born again for 10 years, but I was under the deception of thinking that I had to live holy for God to love me and accept me and that he would love me and move in my life proportional to my performance. And so I was living holier than anybody I knew. And I don't say that in a prideful way. I'm just saying that I, I was doing everything I knew to do. I'll be turning 74 here in just a couple of months and I've never used a word of profanity in my whole life. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've take, never taken a drink of liquor. I've never tasted coffee in 74 years. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, coffee? I'm not against you drinking coffee. I'm just saying that I have lived a separated life, uh, but I got to trusting in what I had done, thinking that that earned something. But when God showed up and I saw the glory of God and I saw the holiness of God, all of my righteousness looked like filthy rags. And I mean, man, I repented in sackcloth and ashes. I honestly thought that God was gonna kill me that night. That's, that's not a joke. I honestly, when I, when I saw the holiness of God, and I recognize my self-righteousness. Did you know self-righteousness is worse than homosexuality? It's worse than murder. It's worse than adultery. Trusting in yourself and saying that, Jesus, I don't need you. Or saying, Jesus, you aren't enough. It's got to be you plus me. That's the worst sin of all. And I was self-righteous. And when I saw it, I honestly thought God was going to kill me. But before he killed me, I was going to confess everything I had ever done or everything I would ever do. I've spent an hour and a half turning myself inside out and repenting and just, I mean, I, I hadn't done that much physical stuff, but Jesus said that if you've lusted in your heart, you're guilty of adul adultery. If you hate in your heart, you're guilty of murder. So I started confessing everything I had ever thought and I was naming names in front of the pastor and the youth director and my best friends. I was naming names. Any reputation that I had, I blew it. And for an hour and a half, I just turned myself inside out. And anyway, I could go on and talk about that. It was, it was awesome. But did you know how that happened? It happened through the word of God. God spoke to me through Romans 12, one and two, and it literally transform my life and put my life on a course that I would have had to have rebelled at God to keep from doing what I'm doing today. People would like to have God speak to them and, and do something like that. But how many of you, and again, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back. I'm just telling you this is how things happen. But how many of you are going to spend 18 months reading the word, even if you're sleepy, you're going to force yourself to stay awake. You're going to do whatever you've got to do because you know that somewhere in here is your answer. There's very few people that are that committed to the word of God. There's a lot of Christians that don't even believe that the word of God is infallible. They believe that it might contain his word but it's not infallible. You can't trust this. You can't believe the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis about God creating the heavens and the earth. They believe that it happened over billions and billions of years, which I could spend hours talking on that. I just happen to have a series on that entitled Biblical Worldview Foundation Series that talks about that. Man, you, there's a lot of Christians that honestly just don't believe in the authority of the Word of God. But outside of Jesus coming and then leaving the Holy Spirit for us, the Bible is the most important thing for you hearing the voice of God that he has ever given us. There are people that have been martyred, that have been burned at the stake, Tyndale and so many other people that gave their life because they understood the importance of this. And yet there's Christians that don't even read it. You know, one of the requirements, if you come to our Bible college, in my class, you have to read the Bible in one year. It's 20% of the grade. 
If you made a hundred on everything, but didn't do the Bible reading program, the most you could make would be an 80. I just think it's terrible for a person to graduate from Bible college and have never read the entire Bible. We have a Bible college. This, our, this is our textbook. We've had people graduate from other seminaries and come to our Bible college and say that in four years of seminary, they never opened the Bible one time. They read books about the Bible. They read this person's opinion and eschatology and all of these things, but they never read the Bible. Man, this is the most important thing outside of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that has ever been given to the world and I tell you, you need to meditate in it day and night. Joshua chapter one, verse eight says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, when you meditate in it day and night, then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. And people are asking for prosperity and good success, but how many of you are meditating in the Word of God day and night? It's a prerequisite for you to be prosperous and have good success. You need to let the Word of God be transformed through the renewing of your mind, and you will prove. The word prove means to make manifest to the physical senses what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. I guarantee you, God's never made a single person and ordained you to be homeless, to be poor, to be sick, to be bitter, to be broken, to be depressed, all of those things. God never created a one of you for that. God hasn't written this in his book. That is not his plan for any single person. But for, in order for you to see his will come to pass, you got to meditate in this word. This is the thing that unlocks the will of God to you. Now you can get specific and, I, and tomorrow, I've got two sessions tomorrow. I'm going to talk about some other things about how you can get very spe specific direction. But why in the world would God speak to you specifically if you aren't doing the general word of God that's revealed in here? People have died to give us this and most of us ignore it at best. At worst, many people don't even believe it. But some people who believe it don't ever spend any time in it. And then you're wondering why God's not speaking to you. I guarantee you, you can't turn off your brain. Some people act like they can. Some people act like they're going through life without a brain. But the truth is you're thinking something all of the time. And if you aren't letting the word of God influence your thinking, then you're letting this world system influence your thinking. You're letting all kinds of other things. You are being programmed constantly. And you have a choice whether you're going to choose life or death. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says, Behold, I call heaven and earth to record against you this day that I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live. God gave you the choice. And it's a simple choice, life or death. This ought to be a no-brainer. You shouldn't even have to have much help on that. Man, I choose life over death, blessing over cursing. But just in case you're confused on this quiz, God tells you the answer. Choose life that you and your seed may live. You need to be meditating in this. You need to let God's word dominate you. And I tell you, our culture today is so contrary to the word of God Lance, the things that he was saying, he, he said a lot of the same things I was saying last night, but he just says it more succinctly. And anyway, I love the way he said it. It was awesome. But man, if you violate your conscience in the small thing, you are going to miss God in the big things. And, and our culture today has just progressively taken steps away from the foundation of this nation, away from the word of God that it was founded upon. And many of us have embraced these concepts Man, I, I try not to watch much television, but the few things that I watch, it's just perverse. It's demonic. Jamie and I were watching something on the, I think it was Black Entertainment Network or something. They came out with some of the most demonic shows. It's demonic. It's of the devil. And there's, I'm, I love you, but there's some of you that'll watch this stuff that is completely contrary to the word of God and then wonder why it is that God's not speaking to you. 
He's speaking to you to quit watching that stuff. And you aren't watching, you aren't obeying it. And if you aren't going to obey that, why does he speak to you about anything else? I tell you, the word of God is foundational to us receiving the voice of God. Let me just share a few scriptures with you. And there's, there's so many, I'm just highlighting a few. But in Psalms chapter 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. Man, I could preach an hour on every one of these things. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's not just good. It's not contains the word of God. It is the word of God. This is the word of God. Man, for time's sake, I'm just going to quote some things here, but over in second, uh, Timothy chapter three, Lance was using those first verses in the first six or seven verses in second Timothy chapter three in his session this morning. It goes on down there in verse 16 to say that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be made perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. The word of God will teach you everything that you need to know. It'll make you perfect and complete, wanting nothing. And if you look those words up in the Greek, when it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, it literally means it's God breathed. This is not men writing about God. This is God speaking through man. God breathed the word of God. And I know that some of you right now, I mean, here you are on a Friday morning. I appreciate you coming out here. You guys are to be commended. You're probably a cut above the norm. And yet I can guarantee you there's people sitting right here that you don't believe that the word of God can be trusted completely. Did you know that Jesus, Paul, Peter, all of those guys did not quote from the original text. They were quoting from the Greek Septuagint, a translation And yet Paul in Galatians chapter six made a big deal out of that God made promise to Abraham and his seed, singular, not plural, seeds, but seed, singular. He wrote all of Galatians chapter three about that one thing. They trusted the translation down to whether it was plural or single, singular. And yet there's a lot of Christians today that say, well, maybe God originally in it, communicated the word properly, but man, it's been polluted. in this. If you don't believe that this is God speaking to you, then it won't benefit you. It won't help you. You've got to believe that God not only spoke originally to people, but he preserved his translation and that this is God speaking to us today. You've got to approach this as this is God's word. Over in uh, second Peter, our first, let's see, where is this? See the first, I get the Peters mixed up. Over here in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter was trying to verify that what he was saying was true. He says, I'm soon going to put off my body. The Lord showed him he was going to die. Lance made mention of that today that he prophesied to him and told him that he would be bound and led to places he didn't want to go. And anyway, he knew that it was about his time to go. And he says, so I'm writing these things down so that after my decease, you might have these things always in remembrance and in an effort to show that this wasn't just a man's opinion that he was speaking for God. He says, I heard the audible voice of God out of heaven say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I saw the glory of God come and overshadow him. And he began to start giving these things as 
verifications that what he had said was true and that it was the word of God and not the word of a man. And then after he had said all of those things, he says in verse 19, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. What can be more sure than hearing an audible voice or seeing a visible manifestation of God? Now again, God can speak to you through those things. I'm not going to spend time on that because if you hear an audible voice, you should be smart enough to figure out that's God. And if you see a visible manifestation, you should be able to re respond to that. But what could be better than those things? It goes on to say in verse 20, it says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy man of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This word moved, if you look it up in W.E. Vine's Expository Dictionary of uh, Greek and Hebrew words, it means that they were moved along. They were born by the Holy Spirit as they wrote. So 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, 2, uh, where was that? 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says that all scripture is God breathed. This verse says that people were born along by the Holy Spirit as they wrote. This is God speaking through people. This is how God communicates to us. And I don't have a verse to put on this, but just my personal experience, I'd say at least 90% of everything that God has ever spoken to me came through the word of God. Now he can give you specifics. There isn't a scripture that says go on television God told me to go on television so you can hear things beyond the word of God. Nothing that will ever contradict the word of God. The word of God has to be the thing that you check everything you say that God is speaking to you. If it doesn't match up with the word of God, then you kick it out. Satan can quote scripture. Satan quoted scripture to Jesus. If you turn to Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 and read about the temptation of Jesus, Satan appeared and, and took him up to a pinnacle of the temple and he said, cast yourself down for it is written. And he quoted from Psalms chapter 91 where he says, he will give his angels charge over thee. And he left out a phrase, to keep thee in all thy ways, which implies that there are ways that God has ordained for you to walk. And when you're walking and doing what God told you, there's supernatural protection. He left that phrase off. And then in the next verse, he says, he will give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. He left that part out. And it says, and they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. That's not what Psalms chapter 91 says. Psalms 91 didn't say lest at any time. There are limits. And Jesus responded by saying, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You can't just use things. See, Satan added parts to it. He took parts away from the scripture. Satan can quote scripture. And if you just have a casual uh, knowledge of the word of God, Satan can mess you up. I heard a story one time about a guy that says, oh God, speak to me. And he opens his Bible and does this. And it says, Judas went and hung himself. And he says, oh, that can't be God. And so he says, I need a confirmation. So he turned over to another passage of scripture and it says, go and do thou likewise. <laughs> you know what? You can get in trouble with that kind of method of Bible study. The scripture says you need to study the word of God to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I think that's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. You need to study. This is God speaking to us, but you have to study the word and put this word into your heart in order for it to have its impact. Man, I, I got off on all of that by half of a verse over here in Psalms chapter 19, verse seven. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The word converting the soul, if you study it back to its uh, origins, where it came from, it means returning you to an original position. Did you know if you're, if you're depressed, if you're sick, if you're bitter, if you're angry, if you're hurt, if you got unforgiveness and on and on and on it goes, none of us started that way. That's not how you started. You've become that way by avoiding your conscience, doing things and, and things that have happened to you 
But the law of the Lord is perfect and it will convert. It will restore you back to an original condition. It'll put you back to the way God intended your life to be. I don't care what's gone on in your life. And again, most people don't believe this. Most people believe that if you were sexually abused, if you were abused as a child, if you had this happen to you or that happen to you, well, then that just basically you have to limp through life and you're never going to recover from some of these things. Man, that's not what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God makes you a brand new person. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And this will convert you. It will put you back to an original condition. You don't have to limp through life and be a victim. You cannot be a victim and a victor at the same time. And people who've in, in embraced a victim mentality you are stopping yourself from ever being a victor because you just identify with that. The law of the Lord is perfect. It'll convert your soul. It'll put it back to an original condition. The testimony of the Lord is pure, making wise the simple. Man, we could spend so much time on that. Psalms chapter 119 verse 99 says... As a matter of fact, I think I got that one marked. Let me read it to you. This is Psalms 119. There's 168 verses in this one Psalm and every one of them is talking about the power of the word of God. Verse 99 says, I have more understanding than all my teachers for thy testimonies are my meditation. Verse 100, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. Did you know all of the problems that you have in your life, all of the problems that we have in this society are because people have departed from the precepts of the Word of God. In our Bible college, I teach a course on Proverbs and we go verse by verse through the book of Proverbs and I just was teaching this a couple of weeks ago and I tell you, from, from Proverbs chapter 5 through chapter 7, it just talks about the adulterous woman, how that she's hunting and looking for the simpleton Whoever is simple, turn in here. Her bed leads to the paths of hell. And I mean, if you were to just take Proverbs 5 through 7, and if that was in an, um, our American culture, it would radically, radically change everything. It would change the shows that are on. It would change all of the way that they're using sex to promote things. People have departed from what the Word of God says, and that's the reason that our, our society is in such a mess today. This nation was founded on godly principles. It was John Adams, the first vice president, the second president of the United States that says democracy is totally unfit for anybody except a moral and religious people. If we ever cease to be moral and religious, democracy will destroy us. And that's what we see happening. They went on to say that there are no restraints. You can't pass enough laws to make people act right. If they ever lose a moral compass, you can't enact enough laws. And this is what we've done. We've lost our moral compass. They are allowing homosexuality, adultery, lying, stealing, all kinds of ungodliness. I mean, the Bible is literally made fun of. We had one of our, uh, I think it was a senator, anyway, somebody that was in the, the uh, government just a year or two ago and one of the people stood up and started reading the Bible and quoting the Bible and the guy shut him down and says, the Bible has no bearing on anything that we are doing here. I guarantee you that had made all of our founding fathers roll over in their graves. That is completely against everything. But this is the mindset of the ungodly. They have rejected all of the foundation. They, they make fun of you for believing the Bible. I guarantee you, you stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, this is what the word of God says and our secular society will ridicule you. This is at the root of all of our problems. This is God speaking to us. This is God giving us parameters, sidelines. It's like, you know, if you're playing football, you've got sidelines and you can't go outside of those sidelines. You're out of bounds. We can't... Why, why do we want God to speak things to us if we aren't even following what his word says? 
His word says that all of these things are an abomination to him. And he mentions those things by name. And yet our society today is promoting these things that God says are a total abomination. And then we wonder why we can't hear the voice of God. It's because we aren't listening to the voice that's written right here. You know, when the Lord finally called me to that experience that I talked about, man, after I saw the glory of God and I repented and instead of God killing me, I had supernatural love flow through me for four and a half months. I was caught up in the presence of God for four and a half months. It was awesome. And I instantly knew that I was going to spend the rest of my life trying to share what I had seen and what God had revealed to me with people all over the world. And so I started heading in that direction, trying to share. But man, uh, I struggled for a long period of time because I was an introvert. I couldn't even look at a person in the face and talk to them. If a person that I didn't already know and have a relationship, if a stranger came up and talked to me, I just would freeze. I couldn't say anything. And yet I had this burning on the inside. I mean, you still think it's pitiful, but it's not as pitiful as it used to be. And I struggled and it was so bad that every time I'd try and get up, it, would, I'd, it was just terrible. And I would apologize and say, God, I'll never embarrass you or me again. I'll never minister in front of people again. And yet it'd be like fire shut up in my bones. I couldn't forbear. And so finally, it's a long story, but... I uh, accepted ministering at our layman's Sunday in our Baptist church. I don't know why I accepted, but I told them I'd do it. And after I accepted, I was just miserable. And this is right when Jamie and I got married. We, we got married in October. And in January, uh, I was, it was coming due that I was going to have to minister soon. And I was sweating bullets and just saying, oh, God. How I, I need help. And anyway, through the word of God, I, I started to go to bed and I just couldn't go to sleep. And back then, man, by the time my head hit the pillow, I was asleep. And I laid there for 30 minutes or so and I couldn't go to sleep. So finally I got up and so to keep from waking Jamie up, I went into our little living room that we had in this one bedroom apartment. And I just said, God, what do you want? And I mean, the power of God became so strong that for over two hours, I just laid on the floor, afraid to open my eyes because I wasn't sure what I'd see. And I just, finally, God, what do you want? And the Lord spoke to me through scripture. Jeremiah chapter one, verse four, before I formed you in the womb, before you came forth out of your mother's belly, I sanctified you and I ordained you to be a prophet under the nations. And Jeremiah responded exactly the way I was responding. He said, ah, Lord God, I'm a child. I cannot speak. And he said, say not you are a child because you will go to all of the people that I send you to and you will speak this word. And then he sent me over to Jeremiah 5, 14. It says, because you speak this word, I'll make my word in your mouth fire and the people would. And going back to Jeremiah chapter one, then he touched uh, Jeremiah's mouth and put his words in his mouth. You know, that happened to me. January of 1973, God touched my mouth. God put his word in my mouth. And I mean, it just, boom, it transformed me. I got up in front of my Baptist church. Before that, the longest I'd ever preached was five or 10 minutes. And that's after memorizing two or three sermons. And I'd get so nervous, I'd just preach them all in five minutes. I got up in front of my Baptist church and I preached for two hours. They had to come up and take the microphone away from me and tell me to sit down and shut up. Man, I was on fire. And you know how that happened? I'd been meditating in the word and God spoke to me through his word. And I can, I'm going to give you many, many examples tomorrow when I teach on this of how you can hear specific direction and God, how God can give you specific direction but I'm telling you, there is nothing that you will ever hear from God in an audible voice, a vision, or anything that will ever supersede the Word of God. This is the foundational way that He speaks to you. And if you aren't honoring this, if you don't love the Word of God, 
Those scriptures over in Psalms 119, it goes on to say your word. I love it more than meat. I love it more than my life. If you don't love the word of God, if you don't honor this, then I don't believe that God is obligated to show you anything beyond this. Man, if I loved you enough that I wrote you something that would answer all of your questions and people died to get this message to you. I mean, people gave their life and then you take it and you just leave it on a desk somewhere and never open the thing. It'd be my reaction to think, well, why should I say anything else? God loves you. God, you're accountable. It says in uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 48, unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. The more you're given, the more you're accountable to God. Why would God speak things to you that you just make you more accountable if you aren't even acting on the word that he's given you? I'm telling you, this is the foundational way that God speaks to us. And brothers and sisters, I'm not saying this to condemn anybody, but I'm saying it to open up our eyes. We are wanting God to do these great miraculous things and to do something spectacular when we won't even take the written word of God that's already been given to us and we aren't living in it. We aren't honoring it. Man, I could make millions of applications right here, but just like what Ashley was talking about, he shared scripture with you about God loves a cheerful giver. Most of us know that, and yet most of us don't comply with it, and we don't sit there and give cheerfully. We give grudgingly and of necessity. He told us to give, and it'll be given back unto us. You could make so many applications right here, and there are people right here in this room who I love you, and God loves you, but you aren't acting on what the Word of God says concerning giving, and yet you're wanting prosperity, but you won't do what the Word of God says. It doesn't work that way. Man, if I had time, I could turn over to Mark chapter 4 and show you that the Word of God is like a seed. And 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 says, We are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God that lives and abides forever. God's Word is a seed. And over in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 where it says that word seed, that is translated from the Greek word sperm, or excuse me, spora, which is how a flower pollinates. And spora is a derivative of the Greek word sperma, where we get the word sperm from. The word of God is a sperm. It's a seed. And you have to take this seed and plant it in your heart. And if you do that, that's what this teaching I have entitled, Plain is Dirt. Now, your, your heart is the soil. It's the dirt. The word of God is the seed that activates what's in the dirt. You got everything in Christ that you'll ever need, but this is the sperm. It's just like a woman. She has everything that it takes to be able to produce children except a seed. The seed has to be sown. You have everything on the inside of you to, for healing, but you need to take the seed, the sperm of God's word and plant it in your heart and God's word, like it says over in Proverbs chapter four, around verse 20, it says it's health unto all of your flesh and life unto them that find it. Man, when people get sick, they want to go to the doctor and take a pill. What you need to do is take the gospel, amen, <laughs> and sow this seed in your heart and the word of God will be health. Psalms 107 verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. The word of God will bring healing to you. This is a seed planted in your heart and I guarantee you it'll produce health. Exodus chapter 23, verse 25 says that he, talking about this angel, will bless your bread and water and I, God, will take sickness away from the midst of thee. The word take and away is the same Hebrew word and it literally means to turn off. God will turn off sickness in the midst of you. That's the promise of the word of God. There's not... One out of a thousand Christians that believes that. Most Christians believe you just have to get sick. It's just part of life. Flu season. You don't have to do that. I'm not a perfect example, but man, I don't get sick. I don't believe in getting sick. 
I've actually had people that had COVID and they said, don't touch me, I got COVID. I said, come here. And I said, you touch me, those COVID germs will die. Amen. No plague. Psalms chapter 91, I believe it's around verse 10, 9 or 10 says, no plague will come nigh my dwelling. How many people believe that? And you're believing God for healing and yet, man, people don't believe that. I tell you, brothers and sisters, all of our problems, not only on hearing the voice of God, but just so many things come back to the fact that God's word is not authority in our life. Romans chapter three, verse four says, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. You have to let God be true and yourself be a liar. You have to let God be true and the doctor be a liar, the lawyer, the banker be a liar. God's word has to be absolute truth, final authority in your life. And if you don't have that attitude, you might have a miraculous encounter where a donkey comes up and speaks to you. You might have a bolt of lightning or something, but you aren't going to hear God on a consistent basis if you don't honor the word that he's already given you. And again, I'm preaching to the choir. You're the people that are out here on Thursday morning, Friday morning, whenever this is. You're the fanatics. And yet, I just know that there's a lot of you. If I, if I, was, if I was to ask you not just how many of you agree with what I'm saying, but how many of you practice it. How many of you spend lots of time in the word of God? There would be a lot of people in this room that you agree with what I'm saying, but your lifestyle, you don't live it. You don't do it. You let other things choke the word of God. The cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches and the other things choke the word of God. You, you say that you believe what I'm saying, but you don't do it. Faith without works is dead. You got to get to a place that you not only say you believe it, but you do it. I guarantee you, if you meditate in the word of God day and night, you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success, period. End of story. That's it. If you aren't prospering, if you aren't succeeding, you have not made the word of God ultimate authority in your life. I had a woman this morning who hit her head and said, because of it, she's having depression and other things. And I said, so is it the hitting your head that's caused? And she says, I don't know if that's it or not. And I said, well, I don't know what the problem is, but I know this, that if you keep your mind stayed upon the Lord, he'll keep you in perfect peace. It doesn't matter if it's physical. It doesn't matter if it's demonic. It doesn't matter whatever. You keep your mind stayed upon God, you'll have perfect peace. If you don't have perfect peace, you haven't kept your mind stayed upon God, period. End of story. That's it. It's not your hormones. <laughs> it's not your chemical imbalance. People are always looking for some organic reason, some way that you can justify and deal with things without having to just seek God with your whole heart. I tell you what, that's not the answer to your problems. You might be able to cope using some of these other methods and stuff, but you'll never become a victor until you take the word of God and it becomes absolute authority. And man, I'd, I've got about five or six hours worth of things I'd like to say, but I quit. <laughs> the heart can't absorb more than the seat can endure. <laughs> so Father, we love you and we just thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming and bearing all of this. Thank you, Father, for touching people's lives, speaking to them. Thank you for people literally giving their life, dying so that we could get the word of God. Thank you that you spoke through people. Thank you that the word of God is alive and powerful, that it burns in our heart. Thank you that you can give us direction through your word. And Father, I just have shared these things from my heart. I believe that you touch people here today, that they would put a new importance a new priority on the word of God. That if these things I've said are true, Father, I'm praying that you would just cause people to commit themselves to it, that they will search the word of God day and night to be able to see their answer and to receive the things that they need from you. Holy Spirit, I just welcome you to take these words and let them burn in people's hearts. Thank you, Jesus. 
And Father, we thank you for that. And we, I'm just, I believe that God is causing some people right now to just make a commitment that you are going to put the word of God as priority in your life. That you'll not go through a day without letting the word of God literally dominate and impact you. Thank you, Father. We, we believe this is going to change people's lives. Give them a path to run on. And we thank you for that in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to invite our prayer ministers to come down here. If there's something that we can help you with, you know, some of you may need to come down here and say, man, I repent for neglecting so great a salvation. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter two. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Some of you are asking God and wondering why hasn't God healed me? Why hasn't God blessed me? And yet you aren't taking the seed of God's word and using it. You don't have to look any further than this. Some of you need to come forward and repent and say, God, forgive me and just agree with somebody. But anything we can help you with, whether it's healing, whether it's finances, whether it's prayer for your marriage or anything, we want to be able to help you. Remember that tonight we start at seven o'clock. Lance is going to be up again tonight. And I tell you, I believe it's going to be awesome. And then we have uh, services tomorrow. We have two services in the morning starting at nine o'clock. And then tomorrow afternoon, we will start at two o'clock, 2.30 tomorrow afternoon. And that will be our last session. And we won't have a Sunday, uh, Saturday night service. So anyway, thank you for coming. God bless you. I pray this stirs you up so that you don't settle to the bottom. Amen. Come forward and let somebody agree with you. God bless you. You are dismissed.